for Wisconsin International University College, Ghana. Before her appointment, she was part of the editorial team for the Wisconsin Journal. She is also the current country coordinator for copyright issues for electronic information for librarians, EISL. She is a member of the AFLIA, that's African Library and Information Associations and Institutions, Working Group on Copyright and Legal Matters. She specializes in intellectual property and related issues and is currently developing expertise in copyright issues in academic libraries. She has since published several articles in world-renowned library journals. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope by now you know the one we are referring to. Let's give it up for our own librarian, Dr. Teresa Edu. Thank you very much, Lily. Good morning. It's good to be back. Today is the third day of three days of stimulating intellectual discourse. And I believe that all of us have had lots of things to think about throughout the various discussions we've had, the presentations that have been made and all. I'm ex extremely grateful to the organizers of this program for giving me the opportunity to chair the last day and the last day of this program, that's this plenar ple plenary session. This morning, our topic for this session is multidisciplinary research for health and development at UHAS. And to do this for us as someone we all know, but for the sake of our visitors, and those of us who may not know him, I'll give just a brief introduction of him. He is in the person of Professor Harry Kwame Tagbo. Professor Tagbo is the pro vice chancellor of the great giant rising, the university of Health and Allied Sciences. He graduated from the School of Medical Sciences, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in 1993 as a medical doctor and began his medical career in the Agogo Presbyterian Hospital in the Asante Achim North District of the Asante region after which he worked in several other districts. The Catholic Diocese of Sunyani, in recognition of his dedicated service, adjudged him the best diocesan doctor in 1999. He also received a citation from the chiefs and district assembly on behalf of the people of, of Inkuranza in recognition of meritorious service in 2004. Professor Tagbo obtained a doctorate in public health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK in 2005 through the Gates Malaria Partnership funded by the Gates Foundation. He then joined the School of Medical Science at KNUST as a lecturer in October 2006. 
He was the head of Department of Community Health and later head of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics of the School of Public Health. While at KNUSC, he was appointed a clinical lecturer by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to coordinate a large clinical trial in West Africa. He is currently a professor of public health. Professor Tagbo has received several large collaborative research grants. His work is focused on the epidemiology and control of malaria in children and pregnant women. Epidemiology and control of neglected tropical diseases, evaluation of disease control interventions and investigation of implementation strategies for effective health delivery. Professor Tagbo has made significant scientific contributions to health policy and practice through his research. Ladies and gentlemen, you would agree with me that Professor Tagbo is really ready to give us the topic for today, which is multidisciplinary research for health and development at UHAS. Can we kindly, with a round of applause, invite him to the podium to give us his talk for today? I think we can do better than this. Thank you very much. Prof, you're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, dear librarian, for all kind words. Thank you very much, uh, our dear librarian. Good morning, everyone. And welcome all of you to this morning session. Particularly, I want to welcome our friends from Nabrongo, Dodua, Tintampo. Is anybody from Tintampo here? Nobody from Tintampo. And then those from Kohwe. You are welcome. I want to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to make this presentation this morning. And I want to thank you also for making time to come and listen to me. My topic is multidisciplinary research for health and development. I was wondering whether I should make it at or in. I'm not sure which one is right. Which one is right? At or in? I'm not sure. So I've made it in. Is that okay? Right. So in the last two days, we've had two plenary presentations on Wednesday and on Thursday. And those presentations have sought to clarify what multidisciplinary research is and why it is important for us to do multidisciplinary research. And on Thursday, we were told, that was yesterday, we were told how to fund that kind of research. So on Wednesday, we were told about what multidisciplinary research is. We're told that health is complex. And so anyone who wants to practice anywhere 
in the health related field really needs to understand it from a multidisciplinary perspective. We're told that research is facing a paradigm shift from the traditional discipline based approach to cross disciplinary design, including multidisciplinary research. Multidisciplinary research was defined as one that takes place when faculty from different disciplines work independently on a common problem or research question. And we're told that the problems that can easily be solved with a single lens of one discipline have largely been solved. We no longer have those problems. What remains, the problems that remain for us to solve are complex, wicked problems that require collaborative efforts across several disciplines. The complex of future challenges is likely to increase rather than decrease, meaning that multidisciplinary research will remain what we will do in the future. And yesterday, the presentation was about how to fund, to get funding for multidisciplinary research. Today, I want to focus on how we can do multidisciplinary research in UHAS. And so my objective for this presentation is for us to start at the end of this, I'm hoping that we'll begin to start the discussion on how we can do multidisciplinary research in UHAS, practically. And so my presentation will not go back to talk about the theories of multidisciplinary research, but using an example, I'll try and uh, illustrate some of the practical steps involved in multidisciplinary research. And that should help us pick up some key points on how to conduct multidisciplinary research. And we'll look at how to promote it in UHAS. And we'll see what frameworks we have to help us do that in UHAS. So this is the uh, example I want to use to uh, illustrate that. I'm, I'm using this example not because uh, I'm involved, but because it's what I'm familiar with. I, I, I have to talk to so many people and it was not clear to me how, how they did there. So it's, it's basically for the purpose uh, of this presentation. So it starts with you uh, identifying what problem there is. And so for this particular one, the problem was that there was an emergence and spread of parasite resistance to sulfadosin pyrimetamine, which is used for intermittent preventive meds, uh, intermittent preventive treatment of malaria in pregnancy, which means that that strategy that we use for pregnant women or to control malaria in pregnancy, we were afraid that it was no longer working. So that was a problem that uh, we identified. When we identified that problem, uh, uh, problem uh, we, had, uh, uh, we had some questions. And the questions were that, do we have a, an alternative? If we say that um, SP was resistant to malaria parasites, do we have an alternative? We said, yes, we have an alternative. Then the question and that alternative, we said it is intermittent screening and treatment of malaria in pregnancy. 
compared to intermittent preventive treatment of malaria pregnancy. So the subsequent questions were that, is it more effective or efficacious? Will it be acceptable to both providers and the pregnant women? Is it something that is cost effective? Because uh, if you have an intervention, people should be able to afford it. So, so these were some of the questions. And based on these questions, we then had a team, a multidisciplinary team, um, epidemiologists, microbiologists, pathologists, because if you understand malaria and pregnancy, you will know why we need a pathologist. We had pharmacologists, health economists, statisticians, um, uh, social scientists, uh, obstetricians, research managers, and a number of doctors and midwives. So this research went on with this team and it was in four West African, uh, we had this in Mali, Burkina Faso, Ghana, and the Gambia. And at the end of the research, the data gathered, the various researchers published what they found. And these were some of the publications. Everybody in the team published what they found. Uh, about the problem related to the questions that were posed. WHO then asked us to come. You know, WHO has uh, an evidence review group. So based on the data that was generated, and if you were saying that you have an alternative before WHO would accept it, they would have to review it. So a meeting was called in July, 2015, to review everything, all the data we had. So that was uh, the process. Uh, it looks short, but it was actually not short. There was, you needed to do so many things back and forth before we got to this point where we had data to go and present to the WHO. But what points can we take from there? The first point, which is important, is that you evaluate multiple perspectives of the problem uh, as a team. The problem is big. And if you are looking at it from where you are sitting, you think it is that. But you must allow everybody to look at it and be able to express what they are seeing and generate the data that they have. You don't try to do anything. So you allow everybody to look at the problem and then you discuss that. The other points noted is that researchers, as I said, from different disciplines work independently on the problem or research question. The researchers share the research goals. The goal we had, they all have the same goal. Do we have an alternative for uh, this strategy that we thought was failing? And they all work on the same research problem, but they looked at it from their own disciplinary perspective. The findings from each discipline are supplementary. So you saw all the publications, they all will go to answer that one question. And the advantage to such multidisciplinary research is that each aspect can be analyzed by a, a particular specialty. The pathologist can do it, uh, the health economist can do it, and that is what is necessary. So basically, that is what it is. But then how do we 
promote it in UHAS? How do we promote it in UHAS? Uh, if I said, how do we promote it? Basically, that is the way to go now. We don't have a choice. And this has started long ago. They've been drumming this. And so I got this, said, if you want to solve uh, this wicked health issues, then you train your scholars to think multidisciplinary, which means that the kind of training we, we provide here should be multidisciplinary. And so that is, so uh, it is not wrong if we say that we want to promote multidisciplinary research in UHAS. The first thing in any multidisciplinary research is for the team of researchers to have what we call transferable skills. It's important. You need to have transferable skills. And the types of skills to are transferable skills are listed there. I'm sure when, when you go, you, 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 you can read about um, all of them. These are important. You cannot work in a team if you do not have these skills. You cannot work in a team if you do not have these skills. But the point is that these skills, we are not born with them. So you have to train yourself to be able to do that. And so what do we have to do? Do we have the frameworks for that? I believe we have the framework. We have the act of UHAS. We have the statute of UHAS. That gives us the mandate to do that. We'll come to that shortly. We need to build the capacity that is needed for that. And we have the framework, the guidelines we have for promotion. We have that. Uh, the administrative staff, we have to find a way to train them. They are important. Our graduate training programs recognize that. I'll show you that recently, uh, very, very shortly. And above all, we have to recognize it. We have to recognize multidisciplinary research. In some universities, it doesn't happen. You must be the first author. Otherwise, it's as if you haven't done anything. I've seen a publication with 2,000 uh, authors. Can you say the person who is number 1,000 didn't do any work? It's so important for them to list all the 2,000. So it's, uh, we, we, we need to recognize um, everybody. So the act or the vision of you has gives us the mandate for us, we do not have a choice but to begin to do multidisciplinary learning and multidisciplinary research. And I believe that's why in UHAS we have a research fund. We, we have the research fund in UHAS, which is trying to help us do that. Even for the fact that for this workshop, uh, for this meeting, this three-day meeting, the theme itself shows that UHAS is serious about multidisciplinary research. So uh, as a university, we are ready for that. But you just say that you are ready, what do you do? You need to build the capacity of your faculty, and the other staff. And again, there's a framework for that. And um, if you look at, that's why I brought it, page 84 of our basic laws. I want to read it. The quality, so this is number one. And uh, progression from one rank to another. It says, the quality of the university can only be, the, the, can only be dedication and service 
can only be achieved through dedication and service of the faculty. So objective, systematic, and thorough appraisal of each candidate for promotion in academic rank is important. And the university will promote a faculty development program tied to the promotion process. We haven't used that. But if we want to now ensure that everybody is ready to do what the university wants, then we, so I don't think you should fear. It says it's the university responsibility. It's not yours. It's the university responsibility to develop a program, a faculty development program to help you. Faculty members seeking promotion in academic run are expected to demonstrate the extent to which they reflect the values, excellence, innovation, integrity, and service and care of the university in teaching and educational development, scholarly activities and service as appropriate to his or her discipline. So there is a framework. Sit back and ask the university to, to, to develop the program for you. Will you do that? Or you are just happy sending a number of papers and this hasn't, I'm not sure why it hasn't been seen. Have you seen it before? Has any faculty seen that in the basic laws? You've seen it, great. So going forward, it will apply. Another important aspect of the capacity development program is that we must deliberately train our uh, administrators to support our research. You can't be the person in the lab and then be the person now going to be writing reports. So you must train the, the administrators. It has to be deliberate. It has to be deliberate. Often we think we are the scientists. And so we have got the grants and we go and do our, our work. But it's important for you has that we have to carefully look at this and develop them. Because you can't play the game or you can't be part of the world if these people are not trained properly. What you has also done is that in developing the PhD handbook for you has the key parts of that our program in natural fact when you pick the you has PhD handbook from page five to seven the key things you'll notice about our program is that every PhD student before you come out you must have transferable skills. You must go through it. So those PhD programs running now, if for any reason you are not paying attention to that, it's important. We talk about personal development planning. So apart from the skills we say you should have, you must also plan your life. We must see that you are thinking broadly and you are developing yourself. So, the sub, so you shouldn't just bury yourself in your particular discipline, which sometimes those doing PhDs do. All they do is to go to the lab and come back and don't look any, uh, they don't look uh, anywhere again. That is not right. So our PhD program, that is what is meant to do that by the time you graduate from UHAS, as with PhD, then you are ready. You are ready for the world. So you've done all of this to help your faculty and your staff to particip uh, participate in multidisciplinary research. 
what then is necessary is that you must, the university must recognize multidisciplinary research. Currently, the guidelines, which some of you like so much, it's about you must, if, if you are not listed uh, in a certain position, it's, uh, it becomes a problem. But the point about this is that you must recognize what everybody does. You must recognize. So lack of recognitions of want, what people do um, is a challenge, which is why everybody is rushing. When they get something small, they go and write about it and publish. So the key use of positions on publication and grants as a primary indicator of research performance leadership and independence in team science projects should be replaced by transparent, fair processes. And I believe that you has will do that. It must provide improved information about uh, the contributors of individual team members and use and value it's uh, in assessment. There should be strong advocacy. So currently there's a strong uh, advocacy going on for uh, academic and funding authorities to assess productivity of scientists by considering the scientific and policy impact. So it's not just a position and the numbers. What is the impact? What's the impact of that publication? So you can have so many, but what's the impact of that? So it's, 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 it's very important. So there's a movement now, we, we call it DORA. It's the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. And the recommendations they have made, um, yes, reproducing two here. It says, be explicit about the criteria used to reach hiring, tenure, promotion decisions, clearly highlighting, especially for early stage uh, investigators, that the scientific content of a paper is much more uh, important than the publication metrics. It's much more important. For the purposes of research assessment, consider the value and impact of all research outputs. In addition to research publications and consider a broad range of impact measures including qualitative indicators of research impact, such as influence on policy and practice. So the movement now is not just to stick to numbers and where you are listed, but what impact. So that's the movement now. And there are tools that they have developed for us to use. And I just want to show you one of just those tools. It's called contributor roles taxonomy, and they've listed 14 of those roles. So that's why for now, for some time now, applying for whatever, uh, uh, anything we are saying, and there are 14 roles uh, you can specify. There are 14 roles you can specify. So this is one of the tools. There, there, there are many others that we can use and so but this is one of them which we, we can use ladies and gentlemen i have i have gone over this try to make it practical and so i want to summarize and the key point is that the you has act and the vision demands as to be a development agent through research. 
and multidisciplinary research is one of the ways to do that, for us to achieve the mandate. And by that, we we'll become major, uh, uh, when names have been mentioned, you have to be mentioned nationally and globally. And both management and staff of you has need to play their respective roles for us to develop and build the capacity we need for multidisciplinary research in UHAS. And so I want us to start this discussion. And uh, these are the questions I have for you. And the question is, can UHAS consistently ho host large-scale multidisciplinary research? What will it take for us to do that? What limitations do we have currently that we have to work on? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Let's start the discussion. Thank you very much, Prof. I think we can do better than what we just did. This has been another stimulating talk. It has given us a lot of things to think about as an institution. And sitting there listening to him, as an individual, I was thinking, how can I collaborate with the doctor, the nurse, the statistician here as a librarian to do some collaborative work. I think recently I came for one program here and um, Prof Sansa gave a talk on maternal, some preeclampsia, yeah. And I was sitting down and I was thinking this is something I want to look at as a librarian. I actually mentioned it to her and I think I mentioned that to Professor Margaret Japon as well. And so we have been given a lot to think about this morning. One of the things that also came to me strongly is the fact that we need to train our scholars to think across disciplines and also to have transferable skills. I'm not going to go through his um, lecture or his um, delivery. I want to give us some opportunity to ask questions. I believe there are things we might want to talk about, the, some of the practical things he has said so that we can look at the way forward. And so would um, give the opportunity for all of us to do that. If we put up our hands, you'll be called to do that. Yes, Professor Owe. Testing mic. If I hold it like this, I cannot speak. No. I can turn it on now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, the, the final time, if it doesn't work, then I won't, I won't contribute. Oh, it's working now. Thank you. Prof, thank you. I think I got, I got intrigued when you were going through this presentation. 
I would like to re echo a point. And I want to say that we, we on a very formidable road. The only thing is that it's taking us too long to make the impact that we can make in this area. You has is well placed. In fact, you talk about health, you talk about all the disciplines that you listed over there. We have them. They are available. My challenge has been how we can take advantage of the rich community that we have here in our various schools to work together and make the impact that we need to make. One of the moves that from my HR we made was to visit all the academic institutions and sit down and dialogue with the faculty in those places. Some were cooperative and came on board and have collaborated, not necessarily with IHR, but with other people within the various uh, academic institutions that we have. And I can see clearly they are making progress. For me, the question we should be asking ourselves is what we can do to ensure that we bring more of our faculty into this basket. What is sad is the younger faculty that we have. I don't know where that mentality is coming from. Instead of uh, listening and ensuring that they are part of the process. I don't need, in fact, I've retired, but I don't need to be promoted in US because that in the highest you can go is what? A full professor. And I have been there. Those younger who should take advantage of this and build them up. Maybe I'm speaking to the walls, majority are not here. If we should go around and check who are the ones finding it important to come and listen to you, it's not the young ones. So that is one particular area. What we can do to sensitize, to bring them up so that they can grab this. I feel sad because if I had that opportunity from the very beginning, maybe I don't know what names they will be giving me now. We struggled. I was there with you, Kitampo Kranza, struggling to build a lab that we can work, isn't it? And here we are. They are here. Though the lab complex is taking time, it's still coming out. They have rich opportunities. And I think that these are the reflections we need to have and see how we can move because we are not making the progress that I thought we would have made from the inception. Thank you very much. That the way out is the, our basic law speech 84. Page 84, how to move from one rank to the next. We will develop all the program. We will do the kinds of things you have said, but we must tie it. Faculty must demonstrate that they've gone through the programs. IHR can mount programs on whatever, but 
faculty must demonstrate that they have gone through that. If we can tie, as the basic laws are saying, tie the faculty development to the promotion, I think it's one way. And once they see the benefits, I believe you don't have to force people uh, anymore. But to begin, I think there should be something that will lead them. I, I think so. And so gradually, gradually, I'm sure we will get there. Thank you very much. Yes, bro. Yeah, um, before my question, just to add something small to what you just said. Yeah. You see, if you take a look at, I think Ghana Medica and then that has have it, Allah Health and all those things. I mean, that before you can renew even your alliances, you must show a certain number of credits workshops and other things you have attended. So if we tie this one, look at such a fantastic workshop we're having. Oh, and look at our own faculty, where are they? How many of them are participating? But if we can look into the future, is that look, beside publications, beside uh, your teaching and other things, at least you must have evidence, show evidence of attending maybe one or two workshops, which is faculty development programs, which can the university must fund, must be able to support faculty and so on. I think these things will help them. So people will no longer have to sit at their own or in their own comfort, but they will run to such workshops. They will value such workshops and be able to get knowledge. My question uh, is uh, implementation, I mean, multidisciplinary research is started by the uh, uh, I identify a problem because that's the key. Without the problem, it means there's no research. So you identify the problem, then you can now have the team to look at the various aspects of this problem. So as you ask, how or whose responsibility to identify that team? Because we have team members. But how can we have the problem? So maybe we need to train or have a central focus to be able to identify specific problems. And with this, not be able to identify any problem there. Lead, you have to be lead in three, is it three or four? In two or three, you need to be lead in three. So it implies that your positioning matters as far as the status is concerned in progression in UHAS. I'm bringing this up because you are the pro VC and that is the direction you are moving in the near future and we have to have some clarity. So how is this multidisciplinary concept in sync with the statutes of UHAS? That is one. The second point has to do with... Maybe you want me to address that first. The first. It's related, so it's not 
The matrix does not matter, but then the content of the paper. But the culture in UHAS currently is that your papers must be in Scopus and PubMed. So again, direction for future. What as ProVC do you have for us young faculty? Thank you. Right. Um, I've, I've heard what you've said, but I can assure you that for some time now, um, I think that we, when, when we are looking at all of those things, we are not so strict on those things. Uh, I can assure you of that. I, I mean, I, I have some uh, memory here. It, it, it's not that strict. And I believe, as I'm saying, it's, uh, it's going to change. I believe everybody on the board knows this. And so I haven't been to any of the meetings where they are insisting. Uh, how many? Uh, is it first order? I haven't, I haven't seen that yet. So uh, it's in the statute, but when it comes to uh, working with it, we haven't really uh, insisted that definitely you must have that or that. That hasn't happened. I, I, uh, I haven't seen it. So, um, uh, I can assure you that you are safe. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Pro VC, for a beautiful presentation. My first question to you is about this multidisciplinary research. We know very well that we have staff who are working with partners from other countries, like you mentioned your case where you worked with others. How are we harnessing our personal experiences and relationships with the research institutions in Ghana? They come for our programs. And all the three research centers are here. Kintampo is here. I just saw one who walked in here. We have Navrongo and then we have Dudowa. Multidisciplinary. Are we limiting it to get you has? They have special skills and they are positioned in a particular way. You have also position. We are the first institution, university that is specialized in health research. How do we continue to partner with them? Now it's based on our relationship because some people, some of us are from that place, they, they come and whatnot. How do we do we have any MOU with them? So that those we know who, when they leave, others who will come in subsequent years will continue to partner with you has. How do we handle that relationship? Do they invite us to their programs? How do we get to participate in their programs as well? How do we work together multidisciplinary? How do we move beyond you has to partner with them? They are positioned in a particular way in terms of policy. We can work with them to get to the Ghana Health Service and the Ministry of Health and others. How do we take advantage of that relationship? That is my first, and then they are here. I don't think they should return to their various institutions without as agree on something for us before they leave. We should hold them, capture them, and we should do something before they leave by the end of today. Or we should continue when they leave. Then the second thing that you said, which really touched my heart, and I'm so excited about, is the fact to do with writing reports and budgets and other, you didn't mention budgets, but there are things that worry me. As researchers, we focus on research, and we are supposed to, uh, Dr. Pado was taking, talking of six. We researchers have to produce 10 papers, and six of them, you should be the key, whether first or last, author. And you have to do it with other administrative work, report writing, and all other activities. And you're talking about the administrators also getting involved. I wish we had several administrators here. And I think that we really, really, really need a lot of help in doing, in writing reports, budgets and other things. It takes so much of our time that doing research, publishing, teaching tends to, you get overwhelmed. So these are critical things that as a pro VC, I would be happy if you can push it, say so that we'll have administrators who have on their shadow, because they also, also need to be 
assure that this work that they are doing is also part and parcel of their work. Otherwise, they also get overwhelmed. So we need administrators who have these specialized skills to be able to write research reports and all those things. So we'd be very grateful if you would push this agenda across. And then my last issue has to do with Dr. Podo. When he was doing his presentation the other day, it dawned on me that, look, when you go to Northern Ghana, we have a kind of pumpkin that we eat. Every part of it is consumed. How can he partner with institutions in Northern Ghana to do? He said he struggled to get pulp and other things. If he had contact, if he knew about this, the melons we have in Northern Ghana that we eat, every part from the leaf to everything, he could have done a lot of things on those ones. So we should partner with other, we are here. There are several regions that we can work with. So we should partner and get to know what is even within Ghana. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I pledge on my honor that I'll do my best. I... Thank you very much once again, Prof. I think that you would all agree with me that this has been a, a very interesting session. Um, one of the things he said, which I want to reiterate, is the issue of personal development planning. All these things we are talking about, if we all, we, we all have the plan to develop ourselves as individuals, I think that it would help us. Probably this place would have been filled up because we would know that we have personal, as a personal responsibility to develop ourselves as individuals. I think that um, we can give Prof. Tatago a big round of applause. And Prof, before you go down, the planning committee The planning committee of the second research determination forum wants to honor you with this plaque. With this plaque for delivering a plenary session on multidisciplinary research for health and development at UHAS. I think another round of applause will be good. It's now time for the oral presentations. And so I invite Mrs. Charity Ose to introduce to us the moderators for the session. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you, Pauline. So um, our first moderator for this morning's program is the Professor of Medical Imaging Instrumentation and the Dean of the School of Allied Health Sciences. As a senior academic, he has developed and handled several curriculum subjects at both postgraduate and undergraduate. He has transformed the School of Allied Health Sciences and has, over, and has also birthed the School of Sports and Exercise Medicine, and also introduced the first ever bachelor's program in orthotics and post. This professor worked at the University of Ghana on a number of academic boards and several committees before joining the university. He is an accomplished researcher and has conducted extensive research. Human health, patient radiation protection, and isometry using medical imaging modalities such as mammography, ultrasonography, computed thermography, and magnetic resonance imaging. He has published several peer-reviewed articles in many reputable international 
journals as well. Ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome Professor Eric Pesci Ofori as our first moderator for the morning. Our second moderator is also a medical officer by training and currently the director of the Dodowa Health Research Center. He worked in the Ministry of Health for several years and at the Konfuanochi Teaching Hospital and Tunyani Government Hospital before starting his research career at the Navrongo Health Research Center in the year 2000. With training in genotology and medicine and venotology and others, his interests have been in the HIV, AIDS, and sexual reproductive health. He worked extensively on the community health and family planning project, which has today transformed into the CHIPS compound concept. You can find him on Google Scholar and several other publications to his interest. Please let's welcome Dr. John Williams as our second moderator. Welcome. Good morning to all of you. Um, this session, um, just a small correction. From your, uh, we're going to have four presentations. I think in your um, book is three, but I've been my attention has been drawn to read that you have the first one, uh, which will be delivered by um, Margaret Japon et al. The, the group. Then the second one will be uh, Ivo Jani et al. Then we'll have the third one, which will be Cedric, Jijo, Kojo, and the group. Then the third one will be, the last one will be by John Inso, Adinana, and the group. So um, I will hand over to my colleague to call them the presenters. I think what we're going to do is the presenters will all present, then uh, you, they will note down their questions. Then when we finish, you can direct your question to a specific uh, presenter. That will uh, be okay for us to be able to uh, catch up with the time. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So our first session today is on multidisciplinary research. I think Professor Tagbo has already set the stage. And as Professor Ufori said, we have four presentations. So we're already um, almost an hour behind time, but would like to invite Professor Margaret Japon et al. to present on responsive parenting, a convergent mixed method synthesis of learning from community st stakeholders for improved adolescent sexual and reproductive health. Okay, that's fine. So if you just mention your name and name. Good morning. My name is Percival Agodo, um, and I'm presenting on the team. The, the title is Responsive Parenting, a Special synthesis of um, adolescent sexual health products. So, so just a quick one before he begins. So, all the other presenters, uh, this mic come in two parts. The down here, black, and this light are the transmitters. So that is what connects with the receiver for us to receive their sound. So when you hold it down, we don't hear anything. But if you hold the middle, it will still transmit so we can hear you clearly. Uh, not specifically for him, 
We noticed his throat yesterday. And so every other person who would use the mic, uh, please let's observe uh, this uh, mic etiquette. Thank you. Okay, so I stand corrected. Thank you very much. Okay, so like I said, I'm Festival Agodo, and that's the title of this presentation. Um, this is the outline. We are we're going to go through the background and all the way through the acknowledgements. Um, so sometime in 2018, um, I had the privilege to be involved in an in implementation research training here in UHAS, led by Professor Japon and uh, Prof. Ansa. And um, as part of the training, we, we noticed over time that um, in Adaklu, the Adaklu district, um, in 2015, Adaklu was, was, was rated, rated as the district with the highest um, pregnancy rates in the, in the district, in the region. Then in 2016, the, the district health management team decided to do something about that because they didn't want to remain the ones the flag of being, having the highest um, uh, teenage pregnancy rates, and so they, they decided to in, to implement what we call the adolescent what they call the adolescent clubs, and the goal of the clubs was to encourage the empower the the adolescents to assess um, adolescent sexual health with reproductive um, rights and and, and and knowledge education, and so in that year the rates reduced from from twenty three to seventeen percent. And then in the following year, the, the Ghana Health Service introduced what they call the Girls Iron Folate Tablet Supplementation, which is basically called the Gifts Supplementation Program. Now, once that was introduced, the, the, the community members began to have distrust for the health system because they felt that these gifts that was given to the young girls was actually a form of contraception, uh, uh, contraceptive pills. And so that may have contributed to the reduction in teenage pregnancy rates. But, but then, um, so that led to some mistrust for the, for the health team. And around this time in 2018, the implementation, implementation health research training happened. We had the privilege to go to the district, um, one of the communities here in Kodobi. And whilst we were interacting with the, with the community, we learned about these, and then this led to the project which birthed this paper. Now, so then that was paper, and this project was sponsored by the IDRC, and and we and that's what I'm coming to present to you about. So, so the aim of the original study was to strengthen the capacity of district health management teams in interrogating data, particularly from the DEMS um, platform, and, in, and using that to engage stakeholders in the community so to be able to make effective decisions and better plan for for addressing the problem of high teenage pregnancy in the region. Now, and, the, I, and the, the, that project was more of an implementation research um, concept. And so it has a pre in, in, in implementation phase, intervention phase, the intervention phase, and then the, the final, the evaluation phase. Now, the, the, the data I'm presenting is from the baseline of this study, where we, we, want, we sought to understand what the situation was amongst the, 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 in, the in the district. And so we use mixed methods. We, we, we did a survey using the EPI um, cluster sampling method. We, 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 we sampled 222 adolescent caregiver pairs, and then we, we used um, John Cleveland's, Cleveland's um, um, two in illustrative um, tool for, for interviewing young people to, to assess um, the state of of adolescent sexual reproductive health among the adolescents and their caregivers. And then we also did some, some focus group discussions among um, I mean, community leaders, um, chiefs, um, health workers, and then also we did some KIIs, key informant interviews amongst the, um, we were using community focal persons for adolescent health. So we we're looking at I mean, clean mothers or, or, or um, Teachers who were related, who were directly involved in adolescent interventions in the in the in the communities, and when we did that, we now put the data we had together, and then for, and, and did the what we call the convergent analysis and try to to learn from the data what the data was telling us. 
Now, so I'll move on to talk about the respondent characteristics. So generally, there were about 57, 59, about 60 percent of the, of the of the respondents were female, who were adolescents were female. About 90 of them were in school, and we noticed that averagely the, the age of first sex was just under 15 years. So before the the, children, the adolescents turned 15, they they, they, had, they had already uh, engaged in in some sex. And, some of them were as low as seven years. Now, the, 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 among the community leaders, we, we, we also had um, about 75 of them, and most of them were, were, were male. Then the caregivers, so we, if you remember, I said we had caregiver adolescent pairs, and most of them were in the age of 30 to 39. The, the, most of them were females, and, and um, most of them were, were mothers, and they were farmers. And we also did some, like I said, inter group discussions among health workers. And most of the health workers were, were, were female at the community level. Now, I'm just using this to tell you, to highlight the gaps, the data we, we, we gathered identified, we identified with the, with the data we gathered. So among the caregivers, we, we noticed that issues of single parenting was, 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 a, was, a, was a, an issue. We also noticed that the, most of the time, the parent fathers were not were non existent were not present, and also noticed that early sexual initiations happened among the, the, the adolescents. And like I mentioned, as early as seven eight years, some adolescents had already had their first sexual de debut. Now, then among the community leaders, some of the things that uh, the data highlighted were that they had limited knowledge of adolescent sexual reproductive health rights issues. Now that translated from the community leaders into the, the um, community I mean, caregivers. Now, and then among the caregivers, we also linked, the data started, suggested to us that, again, many of the caregivers spent a lot of time away from, from home, of, of course, for economic reasons. And then, um, again, many of the, of the caregivers relied heavily on, on, on health. They basically outsourced their their parents, I mean, their roles of engaging or teaching the adolescents about adolescent sexual reproductive health to other people, including health workers and, and teachers. Now, and the health workers thought that the, the parents did not properly, I mean, lacked the parental control over their, over their adolescents. And then, the, and then the mistrust also came up from among them. Now, this is a, this is a summary of the things that we, our data suggested to us. But how did you come to those, those um, gaps? So when we asked the adolescents, where do you prefer to get your sexual reproductive health knowledge? Majority said mothers. But the, the, where they actually got these information were from teachers or health workers instead of their mothers. Now, when we asked them, so, so, um, Again, I already mentioned that majority of them live with only their mothers, their single parents. Majority of them were, were, were um, that had never had sexual communication with either their fathers or their mothers, um, and the proportion was higher among with fathers. Then among the caregivers also learned that, I mean, were not aware, most of them were not even aware of what their, their adolescents were, 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 were doing, and the sexual activities of their, of their adolescents. We also no, noticed that the, Whilst they, they, have, they did not approve, majority, almost all of them did not approve of, of, of a romantic relations with their adolescents, but they were not aware of what the adolescents were doing either. Now, we also learned among the community leaders that um, they, 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 they believe that the leaders of the community believe that, they are, that, that many of the community members did not have the capacity to support adolescents when it comes to sexual reproductive health and education. And because there was lack of communication and those things. Now, for example, the one of the quotes out: every parent will bother about what their their children learn at the at the club. We're talking about the clubs. So we we the parents can also be organized and thought on things that that should be that the children should know, so that we can also understand it. Now, um, so the community focus people also also showed us that. Um, they depended more, the parents depended more on health workers, which I already alluded to. Now, when we looked among the health workers, again, I already highlighted that, that even effective parental control, I mean, control was some of the issues that came up. 
So, um, and yet the issues were, were there. Now, we took this data that we collected from the, the, from the stakeholders and we sent them to the communities and uh, asked them and showed them the data and asked them to help us understand what the data really meant. And, and these are just samples of that. Now, and, and again, these are the issues that, we, that came out from there. And what stood out clearly among all the conversations was this one thing, that all stakeholders agreed that parenting was an issue and responsive parenting. And responsive parenting basically means that the parent, a relationship where the parents understand their relationship, what is happening, their, their emotional and physical needs of their, of their adolescents, and they respond to it appropriately. And that is how this, um, that's the conclusion. So basically, responsive parenting is important, and we believe that um, if we highlighted, if we worked on that and highlighted it, it will become, it will be able to um, impact significantly on, on, on the, on the adolescent sexual productive rights um, of adolescents. Um, the project was funded by the IBS, like I mentioned, and we thank all these people, and these are the members of the team. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sorry for rushing you. I was a little charitable with you because the paper is a director's paper. But um, for the next presentation, we'll be a little more strict with the time. We have listed here the topic, transcriptional regulatory patterns of activation induced Cytidine diaminase in P. falciparum exposed tonsillar B cells and asymptomatic, in asymptomatic Ghanaian children. Quite a mouthful. To be given by Ruben Ayivo Jani et al. I have put Prof.N.D.'s name on my paper so that the moderator would have been charitable with me. Because looking at the title alone, I will try and finish it within time. Thank you very much. So as part of our efforts to understand how um, Plasmodium falciparum may predispose antibody producing cells to genomic instability, we study AID, and see how uh, PFAS from induces um, genomic instability in uh, cells that have been exposed to antigens from PFAS. We did this work in, conjunction, in collaboration with the ENT department at Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, and then um, Dr. Alice Berner at the School of Medicine. One of the key, one of the key questions in biology is how an organism with as little as just over 20,000 functional genes, humans are able to mount effective antibody responses to the numerous pathogens that we find in our environment. The answer to that question is that these cells and cells that produce antibodies uh, have developed mechanisms to be able to diversify the only gene that produces antibodies in the B cells so they are able to mount effective antibodies against this. The key mediator in this, in this uh, mechanism is activation-induced cytidine diaminase. What this enzyme does is that it initiates, okay, it initiates two very important uh, gene diversification process in the B cells to diversify the immunoglobulin gene so that the antibody that is produced by the antibody-producing cells can bind and fight ant uh, antigens effectively. So AID, without AID, we will not have highly effective antibodies. People who are deficient in AID often suffer from autoimmune diseases because the antibody producing cells cannot differentiate between self and foreign. So they have their own defenses fighting them. AID is very important. Unfortunately, despite how important this enzyme is, when it is aberrantly expressed and its activity is not tightly controlled, it has the ability to be able to mutate 
genes that, if they are mutated, can cause cancer. So proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. So for an enzyme as important as this, it, is, it makes sense that the cells have very tight and complex regulatory mechanisms to regulate their activity on four different levels. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to limit our talk to the transcriptional and then post-transcriptional control mechanisms that the cell uses to control the expression and function of this enzyme. So transcriptionally, AID works, its, uh, its um, expression is induced through the nf kappa bpi 3 pathway. It has, there are about close to 19 transcription factors that can either induce its expression or repress its expression, depending on where they bind on the AID gene. Now, after the gene has been transcribed, microRNAs are known to bind to the three prime one translated region and target those uh, messenger RNAs for degradation, thereby controlling the abundance of the, of the messenger RNA. Secondly, the mature messenger RNA is alternatively spliced to produce splice variants of the messenger RNA, thereby controlling what protein is produced at the end. Unfortunately, although this tight and um, complex mechanism exists for AID expression. It's been shown that infection with PFAS actually potentiates a deregulated expression of this enzyme. So how, do they, how does this happen? It's been proposed that PFAS does this in one of two ways. The um, red blood cells that are infected with a parasite have the ability to induce what we call high titers of antibodies. And before these antibodies are produced in the blood, the cell, B cells have to go through a reaction we call the germinal center reaction, where AID mutates the immunoglobulin gene to produce a particular antibody. Secondly, because of the way p falciprom modulates the immune system, it takes away the check of the immune system on Epstein-Barr virus replication. For Epstein-Barr virus to replicate, B cells that are infected with that virus have to go through the germinal center reaction. So the same parasite can cause the B cells to go to the germinal center reaction, induces Epstein-Barr virus directed germinal center reactions as well. The same group also found that when they take secondary lymphoid tissues from Ghana and compare it to people who have never been exposed to malaria, they realized that in the germinal center B cells that they get from the secondary lymphoid tissues, the Ghanaian ones have very high uh, AID transcript levels. Unfortunately, the mechanism, the actual mechanism that underlines this deregulated expression of AID is not clearly understood. So as part of the work, we decided to look at the transcriptional regulatory mechanisms for AID in secondary lymphoid tissues tonsils, and then also in children who are um, asymptomatically infected with AID. So we are looking at the secondary lymphoid tissues and then circulating B cells in the blood. So for the first aim, what we did was that we took tonsils both from Ghana and from the US. And when you look at the tonsillar tissue, there are four groups of cells that you find in the tonsillar tissue. The naive ones that have been primed to go through the germinal center. Then you have those that are actually going through the germinal center reaction that we call the germinal center B cells. Then those that after the germinal center reaction, have, been, have, have differentiated into memory B cells for future uh, responses. And then those that are actually primed to produce the antibodies, so four groups. So what we did was that we used flow cytometry to sort these um, uh, cells into these groups. And then we did qPCR to measure the transcript levels of AID and all the related um, tra um, transcription factors. Then we also looked at um, the splice variants of AID that are expressed in these cells, and then the microRNAs that are known to actually regulate the transcript abundance levels of AID. So we used um, IgD and CD38 expression to do the sorting in flow cytometry. And consistent with what is found in literature, we realized that the Ghanaian tonsils actually had high levels of germinal center B cells and compared to the PF negative or the PF naive ones where you have a lot of naive B cells in them. We characterize these cells by the expression of 
MKI67, which is a marker of proliferation. So in among the four groups, the germinal center B cells and then the um, plasma blasts are known to divide rapidly. So they, their expression was actually higher in those groups. Then we measured for the AID transcript. Consistent with literature, we found that AID was highly expressed in the germinal center. And when we compare the Ghanaian tonsils and then the um, American tonsils, we realized that AID was expressed highly in all the four subpopulations in the Ghanaian tonsils compared to the um, American tonsils. Then we looked at, we started looking at the transcription factors that are part of the um, transcriptional regulatory program of AID. These two, IRF4 and 8, are known to be part of the program, but their actual role is not clearly understood. What we found was that um, the levels of IRF4 was not different when you look at the four groups, but it was uh, for that for um, IRF8 was highly expressed in the general center B cells. Now, four known um, transcription factors, PAX5, HOXC4, BCL6, and BAC2 are potent inducers of AIP transcription. And what we found was that all of them are highly expressed in the germinal center B cells. Then we also try to assay for the transcript levels, transcript levels of the splice variants of AID. We used, there are four other um, splice variants in addition to the full length messenger RNA. Um, what we we use um, splice variant specific um, primers to amplify and quantify all the splice variants. What we found in the tonsils was that all the subpopulations actually express this, the splice variants. But what you see is that the um, the full length, which is highlighted here in blue, and then the the next one, which only has a portion of exon four spliced out are highly expressed in the germinal center B cells. The rest were all over the place. Now it explains why, the, the reason is basically because in the, in the, 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 those splice variants actually do not produce any functional protein. Even if they are transcribed or translated, the protein will not be functional. So all the splice variants are expressed in the germinal center B cell subpopulations. Then we looked at the microRNAs. MicroRNA 181B and 155 are known to target AID and then target it for degradation. In the tonsils, what we found was that 181B was totally downregulated, giving room for AID to be expressed. But for the case of 155, it is upregulated in the naive B cells and then the plasma blasts, which do not need any activity of AID. But in the memory B cells and the germinal center B cells, we realized that they were downregulated. So with this understanding, we moved into trying to see what actually occurs in the periphery. We got blood samples from children in primary school from ages six to 12. And then we isolated their white blood cells and did the same PCRs in these individuals. So the food blood count actually told us that these were healthy children, if you look at the erythrocyte indices. What actually set them apart were indices that determine or predict p from infection. So platelet counts, for example, and then the uh, granulocyte counts, for example. We also measured their level of um, um, their cell conversion to EPV. We realized that all those that were infected with Parsifrom have actually been cell converted to EPV. Then we measured their AID um, transcript level. We found that those that were asymptomatic had more AID. The transcript level of the um, splice variants was also similar. The only difference here is that the levels of the other splice variants were very, very low compared to what we saw in the uh, tonsils. IRF4, you recall that in the tonsils, IRF4 had, was not relevant, but here in the in circulation, we realized that it was IRF4 that was highly expressed in the asymptomatic one, but not IRF8. We could not detect BAC2 and then HOX C4 in the, in the circulation, but we found that PC, P, uh, PAX5 and BCL6 were also highly expressed in the uh, asymptomatic one. So in conclusion, in the tonsils, HOX C4, PAX5, BCL6, BAC2 um, might be responsible for why we find a lot of AID transcripts in the tonsils. 
all splice variants are, 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 are actually found in there. And then the down regulation of a, a microRNA 155 and 181B could be responsible for the elevated AID transcript levels that we find in the tonsils. In the periphery, we could only ascribe Pax5 and BCL6 to the enhanced transcription. And then there's also the full length that is predominantly expressed. And then the elevated AID transcript can be seen independent of um, EBV exposure. So I want to thank my mentors um, for guiding me through this. And then the funders, we got funding from the World Bank East uh, project through WAGBIP and then some additional funding from the NIH. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So our third presentation is on the synthesis molecular docking studies and ADME prediction of some new triazoles as potential anti-malarial agents to be given by Cedric Jijo Kojo Amengo et al. So you have 10 minutes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when you present after your director and your UTAC president, <laughs> it brings so much pressure, but I'll try. <laughs> when it comes to killing humans, no animal comes close to the mosquito. And that was a statement made by Bill Gates somewhere in 2010. And because of the killer instinct of the mosquito, as part of our collaborative research and the drug discovery campaign, I stand here to present on the synthesis, molecular docking studies, and ADME prediction of some new trousers as potential anti-malarial agents. The situation is a complex, wicked problem. As uh, uh, Provisi uh, said, it's a complex, wicked problem. And therefore, it's essential and important we look at this uh, presentation. This would be my presentation outline. I'll give an overview up to some of the references that were used for this study. Diseases that are prevalent in the tropics and the subtropics are normally called tropical infectious disease by the World Health Organization. However, malaria is one of these tropical infectious diseases caused by five protozoan species of the genus Plasmodium and includes Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium malaria, Plasmodium oval, Vivax, and Nolesin in humans. Out of these species that cause human malaria, Plasmodium falciparum and Vivax are associated with life-threatening complications. It is part of protozoan disease transmitted by the bite of the female phlebotomine anopheles mosquito with humans as the main reservoir. Artemisin and its derivatives um, have become resistant to this species, uh, to this uh, plasmodium. Um, Artemisin and its derivatives are not able to um, destroy the plasmodium parasite as it used to be because the plasmodium parasite has gained resistance over time against this current chemotherapy of malaria. At present, ladies and gentlemen, the world's largest parasitic killer with estimated 241 million cases recorded by WHO as part of their WHO report in 2021 with 80% statistics in Africa, mostly in children under five years of age, malaria 
is the world's largest parasitic killer. And therefore, with increasing resistance of antimalarials to plasmodium strains, malaria still remains a global public health threat. It is important to appreciate the pathophysiology of malaria. But before we can do that, we need to understand the life cycle. I'll not go into details, but we must appreciate that the life cycle of the plasmodium includes two hosts, in the mosquito and in the human host. And the most infectious stage is normally at the merozoid stage and the trophozoid stage. And therefore, that point is always the point of call in target um, drug discovery targeting the malaria parasite. Phosphonium salts have become one of the recent compounds that have been investigated as potential anti-malaria compounds. Therefore, phosphonium salts are lipophilic phosphorus quaternary compounds that can be used as molecular probes of mitochondrial function. It is known that the plasmodium parasite mitochondria, the inner mitochondrial matrix is highly negatively charged and therefore exploiting this morphological difference between the plasmodium mitochondrial matrix and the human host because it is negatively charged, the phosphonium cations, which are positively charged by electrostatic attraction, can be forced into the inner mitochondrial matrix. On the other hand, nitro compounds or nitro drugs, which have known toxicity, but it has been realized by very uh, researchers, including Patterson et al., that though they have toxicity issues, they can be employed and further optimized to have good anti-malarial properties. And therefore, the aim of this was to revive and synchronize the synthesis and exploration of antiplasmodial activity of nitro-aromatic and phosphonium compounds in malaria drug discovery. Therefore, the main aim was to hybridize the nitro-aromatic group and the phosphonium salt, bring the two of them together to possibly improve the biological activity, reduce resistance, and possibly reduce toxicity. And that was done through the process of pharmacophore hybridization, where the triazole linker was used in linking these two pharmacophores. The objectives was to synthesize one, four, so that I substituted one, two, three triazoles using click chemistry. Secondly, to theta or ligate the one, two, three triazole and the phosphonium salt with the one, two, three triazole linker, and to evaluate the anti malaria activities of the one, two, three triazoles and the phosphonium salt against chloroquine resistant plasmodium for Ciparum DD2 lab strain and also determine the in vitro cytotoxicity of the compounds against human erythrocytic cells and carry out molecular docking and ADME studies on the most active compounds. This is the outline of the methodology. Azides were synthesized in the first step. Click reaction was done to introduce the one, two, three trousers. Brumination was done and the phosphonium salt was also synthesized. The antimalarial activity was also carried out and in vitro cytotoxicity was also carried out. And now the synthesis. During the synthesis of the compounds, four of the azides were synthesized in the first step. They were used to synthesize six, one, two, three triazoles. And then only one phosphonium salt was synthesized as a preliminary work. The compounds were characterized to identify or confirm whether they were really what we synthesized. The compound was synthesized, as, for the instance, this compound was synthesized as a solid with a melting point 130 to 134 degrees, characterized with proton and emerald to determine the chemical environment, HRMS to determine the molecular weight and the molecular fragmentation, and to determine the functional groups infrared was used. In terms of antimalarial activity, you realize that looking at this trend, there was decreasing antimalarial activity from compound one to compound four, looking at the IC50 values. And it was it's worth to note that essential functional groups such as the nitro groups, the propagal OH group, the triazole linker, and the chloro group at the para position in compound four were responsible for activity. 
in terms of cytotoxicity, in vitro cytotoxicity, compound one had the highest selective index, which was far greater than one of a value of 161 and was most selective towards the human erythrocytes. The chloral group and the phosphonium salt head were responsible for increased cytotoxicity of the compound four and the phosphonium salt, and therefore was not worthy of commendation. In terms of molecular docking, the docking was done to find out which proteins the compounds will bind to. And this is an image just showing some of the docking results binding to some of the proteins at the plasmodium receptor site. In terms of molecular docking, the C log P indicating the lipophilicity of the compound was determined. The C log P of compound one, two, three, and four fell within range because Lipinski's roots of five says that when the C log P is less than five with other parameters, your compound is a candidate for oral, to be uh, proceed into the oral drug profile. In conclusion, despite the fact that we have not carried out in vivo work, in vitro work shows that four of the compounds had high in vitro potency against chloroquine resistant DD2 lab strain, of plasmodium falciparum with low toxicity to human erythrocytes. Computational studies, the molecular doc indicates that the compounds have the potential to be developed into drug candidates as none, that's the first four compounds, showed not more than one violation of the Lipinski's rules. They were placed in category three of acute oral toxins, possessing LD50 of 500 to 5,000 milligram per kilogram. And this result, has been disseminated in this journal. I want to acknowledge the presence of these individuals and institutions for bringing this work to a success. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Mengo. I can see you are smiling because I thought you wouldn't make it, but you just made it on time. Thank you so much. So our last presentation is on, for this session, is on enhancing the prebiotic effect of cellulose biopolymer in the gut by physical structuring via particle size manipulation to be given by John Nso Atindana at all. So you have 10 minutes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, after uh, seeing the biochemistry, the pharmacology, and then maybe it's time we talk something about food so that at least we can relax a bit. <laughs> For food, I think everybody likes food. So talking about food, at least we we'll all relax a bit. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, why we decided to carry out this study has to do with the fact that if you look at our food environment, the consumption of dietary fiber is reducing. There are a number of factors. So we try to look at cellulose, which is a natural compound that is all over. And so that we see, is there a way we can improve fiber consumption by I mean, uh, introducing fiber in the number of food samples? That is what we carry out this study. So this is the outline of my presentation from introduction down to the acknowledgement of our sponsors. If you look at uh, dietary fiber consumption, there's enough uh, scientific evidence that the consumption of dietary fiber is very important. And for that matter, its presence in food is very relevant. For example, there's um, a number of studies, a review by uh, some authors, which shows that coronary heart diseases, stroke, diabetes, and obesity, the uh, relative risks are all less than one, which means that indeed there's uh, uh, enough scientific proof that consumption of dietary fiber can actually help to, to reduce uh, a number of uh, non-communicable diseases that we are currently battling with. <laughs> Cellulose in each nat natural state is actually highly insoluble and is poorly fermented. 
So normally in diet, it is considered as a dietary fiber that has not got a lot of water function to, to play, apart from the fact that it will serve as a bulky material that will help bowel movement. But with the advancement of science and technology, we can be able to manipulate it by using a nanotechnology so that it function can be very important in our diet. Dietary fiber gap, like I started the um, introduction. I said, if you look at dietary fiber consumption, there is a drastic reduction in its consumption. For example, if you look at the data um, in Canada, for example, only 16, uh, the actual consumption of dietary fiber is 16 grams per day, and then the US is even less. And Ghana is doing well, about four, 24 grams per day. When you juxtapose this with that of uh, the, uh, DR, uh, the daily recommended intake, we realize that I Ghana to some extent we are doing better, and that has to do uh, mainly to do with uh, our source of what food, which are uh, actually mainly from what plant based when you compare with uh, the other countries. So dietary fiber intake is really low because what right, there's what increase what uh, refined highly refined food in our market. If you go to our market, and there's also an influx of what a lot of what. Um, fast food joint. These are contributing to the less consumption of dietary fiber. And also, if the dietary fiber particles are normally very large, what happens is that its presence in food affects its organoleptic properties. And by that, a lot of people tend to shy away. For example, if you take a wheat bread and you compare it with that of the bread without wheat, people tend to uh, like more of the non-wheat bread. Then why then do we have to talk about nanocellulose? It's because it's a natural, by it's a natural compound it is not biocompatible and it's relatively cheap. So by going the nanotechnology where we can also reduce the size where it will not discourage people from taking because they can see the particle size which influence the food intake. So our objective was to find out at what particle size can we, when we introduce into food, it will be able to manipulate, uh, it will be able to help the gut microorganism to utilize it as a source of what energy. So we set out to look at by trying to identify the size that will help this. So what we did that we started with a natural material, uh, microcrystallizer, which is a commercial base, highly, uh, mostly used by pharmaceutical industry as a drug carrier. And from there, we reduce it to nano size, and then we further use a fiscal means to reduce it to further uh, smaller particle size. So at the end, we have different fractions of uh, cellulose from the same source. That is uh, the micro level and the nano level. The nano level have three different particle sizes. And we now subjected to in vitro. We now characterize because the important thing about uh, biopolymer is that normally, if you know the physical chemical properties, it will help you to be able to know the function it will play in the GIT or even the function it will play when you introduce into food. So we characterize it and also went off further to check the in vitro studies to know if you, um, how can it be fermented if you use uh, the in vitro means and also went on to use an animal model to try to check out how can it be I mean, fermented in the, in the gut. So what we did, uh, we sought to get an ethical clearance from Jiangnan University for the animal studies in order to be able to DNF. We then went on to analyze our short chain fatty acid, also identify the Bifidobacteria. In this study, we focus only on bifidobacteria, although there are many other good bacteria that we could have focused, but we decided to focus on only uh, the bifidobacteria as a starting point. Yeah. Okay, so the, on the characterization, this the morphology that we did, this is what we had. From the figure, you can see that's obviously the starting material, that uh, microcrystalline cellulose, is what bigger particle size when you compare with what the particles we produce. And also, if you look at the particles that was further what, uh, reduced by using physical means, they were, uh, the particles were smaller. Maybe you can't see very well, but if you look at the particles that were further uh, reduced, the least particle size was around 100 and what, four what, nanometers, followed by uh, 100, uh, 230 nanometer and then th uh, 370 nanometer. This was what highly smaller when you compare with that of uh, the uh, starting material. Then we went on to check other physical chemical properties, like the what holding capacity, the uh, swelling capacity, and the surface area, because these are factors that will affect, will affect how the dietary fiber will work, function or the material will function when introduced new food or when it finds its way in the GIT. So you can see that the 
particles, the particle with the least particles are around 100 nanometers, had better water physical chemical properties, which we now went further to check. If you um, check the in vitro fermentation, how is it going to happen? And we realized that the least particle size, uh, we realized that with the pH, we have, because when they say fermentation, pH reduces because of uh, the production of metabolites as well as uh, other uh, compounds produced in the system. So after, after 12 hours of fermentation, we realized that there was a reduction in the pH, which tells that our fermentation was ongoing in the presence of the fiber. Now, we then went further to also check the, the um, bifidobacteria we are trying to look at it. They count whether uh, there will be differences when you compare with the control. Of it. And with the person, the fecal donor one, the person who did the fecal donor one, there was what differences uh, when you compare the two, the three, the four samples. And also the second donor one also had the same thing and the third donor had the same thing. And when you look at the resource critical, you realize that the particles with the least particle size, which was around 100 nanometers, perform better when you compare with that of it. And this mainly because when you look at the physical chemical uh, studies, they presented what good uh, results when you compare with us. So uh, it is been, we be strongly believe that the physical chemical properties improved when we reduce the particle size, such as the water holding capacity and the water swelling capacity, as well as the increase in surface area help the enzymes to be able to, uh, the, bacteria to be able to utilize the, micro, uh, the cellulose as its what energy source. Then we went on to also check um, the sorted fatty acid produced from e uh, each of the donors, any of the fecal matter donors. And you can see that obviously the particle size, uh, the particles that you do, the number of uh, sorted fatty produced also increased, which means that physical chemical properties has something to do with that one, the increase in the particle size. Then we went to the in vitro study to check what happened to the physical, what happened to the short chain as, uh, fatty acids produced, and also what happened to that of uh, the amount of uh, the amount of uh, bifidobacteria that was in the feces of the uh, animals. And obviously, you can see that for the microcrystalline cells and that of the control, there was no difference when you look at the bifidobacteria species produced. But the nanocellulose, you could see that there was what a drastic. Uh, increase. There was an increase in the amount of what bacteria count. And also, when you compare the amount of short chain fatty acid with the three, uh, the three short chain fatty acid we checked, you can see that there was what differences. And it also increased as the particle sizes what, what reduced, which tells you that, yes, the physical chemical properties really improve and has an impact on it. And because the amount of microorganisms produced or bifidobacteria produced in that, uh, in the in the samples, it contributed to the amount of such chain fatty acid produced. In this, we concluded that by fermenting, uh, the fermentability of micro, uh, the cellulose was size driven because which in turn depend on the physical chemical properties of the sample that were there. And for that matter, it informed the reason why the smallest particle size produced what highest amount of a short chain fatty acid and also produce higher numbers of a, uh, by bacteria species. A further recommendation is recommended that um, you should incorporate this cellulose, the most effective one, into real food system like yogurt and ice cream, and then try to study to find out what happened. So we acknowledge um, the our sponsors. That's the, the National Research and Development Program of China, and also the National uh, Natural Science Foundation of China and the first class discipline of the science program at the Jiangnan University who supported us to be able to conduct this study. And our sponsors, this has already been published. And if you want to have more information about it, you can download it and read, or you can contact me for a copy. Then our sponsor, uh, other members, team members read it. And I must say that I was grateful to my mentors, Professor Golf of uh, Golf University, and then Professor Zhong Fang of Jiangnan University, who contributed greatly to ensure the success of this program. Thank you. I think we, we have to give them 
Eu vou enfiar para os... This morning we've been bombarded with chemistry and basic structures <laughs> and that. So it's time for question. There are four presenters. Um, so if you ask a question, you direct a person you want to answer. So any question? Questions? Is that okay? Thank you very much. So uh, the question is directed to. It's to all of them. All of them. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I want to ask myself a question. Um, I come from Osu, and I've come here to listen to this. In one sentence, what did you see? Okay, so we will start. We will start from let's let's start from the diet, the fresh one, yeah. because food is important. So with all this plenty, you know, it. Okay. Yeah, um, I think all I'm trying to say, if you look at our environment now, dietary fiber consumption is increased. For example, the study I quoted about Ghana was done. Uh, the lead professor from SRU with other uh, colleagues. You can see that yeah, 2018, after 2018, you can, yeah, I, I know. You can see that you need to, yeah. Yeah, all I'm saying is that you need to consume fiber. Fiber is, is not, so you need to improve but, fiber. For example, what, stay there, stay there. Yeah. What is that fiber? Which food, so which food should I eat? That That's all that you want to ask. Should I eat more kinky or eat this? That's exactly what. Okay, you eat a lot of fruit and vegetables. Let me put it that way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't know whether to uh, say in Ghana because I don't understand or speak it. So I'll try and simplify it. So um, I'll say that very soon, the anti malaria we are taking may not be working again perfectly. Therefore, we are working towards getting new contact. Okay, thank you. Ruben. Now it's my turn. I, I don't know if there's an um, equivalent word for deaminate in gas. I don't think there is. So um, basically what I'm trying to say is that there is more than meets the eye when it comes to malaria. What we are doing now is in vaccine delivery, we are looking at what happens when you give the person the vaccine. So we are measuring IgG antibodies. But how those antibodies are produced, we don't really understand them. So it is important for us to go to the molecular level and see how the antibodies are produced. So that is what the talk was about. Maybe uh, as a follow up. Uh, Ruby, uh, okay, yes. Oh, festival. I want to answer this. Uh huh. Ask them. Okay, they said they are okay, okay. They're coming back to Ruby, maybe another layman's view in same place. Why is it that only the female mosquito that are giving us a uh, Oh, so virus? it it comes to um some way when you... is it because the female they are wicked? Oh no. Because wicked no, 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 no. So, so on the contrary, females, females are, um, they, they are the reproduction system. They, they reproduce whatever progeny that they are supposed to get. So in the female mosquito, they need the nutrients in the blood to fertilize their eggs. So that is how they'll come. That is why they'll come for so the it's blood. it's not that the female ones no, no, are no, 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 no. They are caring for their young ones. Okay, that's good. Any question from the audience? Okay. Uh, Joy, Dr. Akamazi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the presenters. You've done a very good job. My question goes to the first presenter. Uh, in, in your analysis, 
the results show that um, majority of the um, your respondents indicated that they got the knowledge regarding um, um, how to get about um, sexual something. I should get you clear, but the results show that they got the knowledge from their mothers. But when you were speaking, you said from the teachers. The, the results showed mothers. I'm trying to find out, does it mean that majority of the mothers are equally teachers? So just clarify that. I think it's actually the other way around. The, the data I showed was preferred choice. So where do you prefer to get the information from? And they said they are mothers. But where do you actually get the information from? They were getting from their teachers and health workers. That's actually what I was, pre I was presenting. Does that answer you? I can see one hand. Yeah. Kofi. Okay, from there we'll come to you then. Uh, you can take the. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, my question goes to John. And um, in simple terms, how would we be able to get, you realize that the smaller size, like 104 nanometers had better um, influence. How do we get, and then every day, if I see that, okay, the, this size is very useful. How do I get that size to put in food or normal in a simple way? Do I go to the mill and blend? Do I, what do I do to be able to get that size to make it useful to, for everyday application? Uh, somebody who wants to advise um, people on the use of this um, nano size fiber. Thank you. I think let's take the other questions first. So please take note of that. Um, we will come to you. Uh... Thank you very much. Please, I'm Priscilla Esando from SBBS. Please, um, my question also goes to the nutritionist. Um, it's a similar question to what uh, brother just asked. Uh, please, you finally said that fermentation was what gave you um, the results of achieving a smaller uh, molecular size or smaller size, because the fermentation diagram gave us the 140 nanometer. Yes, so I'm just thinking that if we are to take more of fruits and vegetables as you simply put your work, should we then go to fermenting our fruits and vegetables or fermenting our food small to get this smaller size and um, fibers to be able to absorb more water and oh what do you ask me very much let's pick last one from matilda before uh the respondents can and then we have one online uh, okay. question but we will answer this before you go to the online then. Thank you very much for your presentations. And thanks to Professor Margaret Japo for helping some of us to understand. Now, my question to all of you, what is the policy implication of your studies? Then to the three minors possible, what are your plans towards disseminating this research beyond this poll? to community members who really need to know this because we know very well that they, most of the time they visit the facilities, like uh, for instance, uh, uh, at Indana study, they visit the facilities for nutritional problems and all those things. So how do you intend to reach them to the three minus passive? I know how they are disseminating on the, to the community. So he that cannot, so that question is not for him, but, but, but the two of you, how do you get beyond these walls with, your beautiful okay. finest. Thank you. So we will start with Japo. Yeah, my thank you for your question, uh, Kofi. Yeah, you see, the thing is, um, if you look at cellulose, it's all over. Like you say, your fruit and vegetables, and now you consume it. It is. But the point is that if you look at the way people consume it, we have been driving home. People consume this. It has this content, but you look at the consumption; it's not there. So if you use nanotechnology, there's a lot, there are a lot of instruments that you can use to, pro, uh, to produce it and then make it available. Like for example, the pharmacist can bear me up that if you look at it, we have a microcrystalline cellulose, it's produced from cellulose. So similar way, there are a lot of equipment they are producing it. The idea is that if we can introduce these uh, 
material into certain food like yogurt, uh, ice creams, which normally, if the particle size are too big, you can easily be, uh, you can easily detect it and may not like it. You will not detect it. So why people be consuming people, something like ice creams and those things? It is to serve two purposes. One, it can serve as a dietary fiber. And if it's a dietary fiber and it goes into the column, because we have found that it can be able to undergo fermentation, it produces some short chain fatty acid that can help. That is why we are thinking that if we encourage its production, it can be used as fat substitute as one way. Because if you look at the, the way it behaves, it, it mimics the way fat is. And by acting as a fat substitute, it means that it can end up reducing the amount of fat you can introduce into the food. And then the other question that I was talking about say, is fermentation that you know. If you look at, we have equipment that can be able to tell that the particle size is this and this. So the morphology that I gave, the picture I gave is a morphological study that we did. But we also did what we used light scattering technique that was able to tell us that the particle size is this amount. And the least particle size was about 100 nanometers. And the biggest particle size was 500 nanometers. So we then considered these different particle sizes and then we subjected them to what uh, in vitro fermentation in, in vivo. The in vitro fermentation is whereby we took fecal don uh, uh, the bacteria source was obtained from fecal uh, donors, about three of them. And we didn't want to mix them because if you mix them, maybe they, it may influence the results. So what we did was that we separated them into uh, each individual. Then we look at each individual, how is it behaving? And the other person, how is it behaving? So at the end, the short chain fatty acid, when we use the different particle sizes, the back, uh, uh, carbon source, what we got is what we, we, we I presented. And then talking about uh, the, the policy direction, I think if you look at it, our environment is gradually becoming what dominated with these ice creams, yogurt, and those, and there are a lot of people who are currently producing yogurt and those things. If we can encourage them to use, if you are able to come up with the data that prove that it can be very good when we introduce in the food, because if you introduce in the food and it affects the food uh, characteristics or the, the food organolistic properties, what will happen that people may not buy. So that is why I suggested that let's try to find out is further studies. If you introduce into food, will it be accepted? If you accept it, there should be a way that we can encourage people to consume it. That is why we are trying to, to do, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of policy, you realize that when malaria treatment started, it started with chloroquine. Over time, chloroquine, the plasmodium parasite became resistant to chloroquine and even quinine. And that led to the development of the na national malaria drug policy, which now we are using the ACTs. But you realize that over time, even the ACTs, the plasmodium parasite is becoming still resistant to the ACTs all over the world. And therefore, as a medicinal chemist, looking at the compounds we have so far, even though there's still issues with toxicity, that gives the room as a starting point to develop and modify these drugs, improve toxicity, improve the safety, reduce toxicity, and work on other parameters so that in connection with the pool of other um, drug discovery chemists who are synthesizing or discovering new anti-malaria drugs, we can come out with a suitable drug so that at a point where the ACTs are no longer suitable, we would have a replacement or an alternative for it. So I think that is how we, or this work will contribute to uh, policy making. Thank you. So mine is just simple. Um, there are various levels of research. My research is focused at the basic level and the ultimate goal is towards vaccine development. So understanding the biology is very important for you to be able to move to what molecules you use to formulate vaccines. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions from online. So please, if you can project them, then we take it because of time. Let's give the chance to those online. Um, understood the question is going to be projected so that we you can answer. Christopher, Christopher, can you please read? Yes, 
Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Prof. Amona is online, so you ask his question. Uh, but let's listen to Christopher first. Christopher. Okay, so uh, this is Christopher. It's a question from Mavis. Uh, so I'm reading Mavis' question. She says, to the second presenter, he mentioned there are a number of bacteria they could have looked at, but they decided to major on one. Any reason for the type of bacteria chosen? No, it's, I think it goes to... Uh, in brief, right. Yeah, the, the main reason is one of the uh, most popular uh, probiotics. That is why we decided to con uh, concentrate on that. On YouTube. The one online, Christopher, please go ahead. Okay, so I'm asking Prof. Amunai's question. Uh, it says, how much cellulose do you expect to be in the yogurt for it to be effective? The applicability of the work is not clearly presented. And, it, and then there's another one from uh, Sadat. It says, regarding the cellulose manipulation, did you consider the effect of anti nutrient factors such as phytates in fiber and how the methods applied could impact their effect. Okay, Thank so you. they are all to the food man. Yeah, um, it's true. We did not consider that at this stage, but there are a number of other studies which we considered. For example, if it's a broad studies that we did, if you look at, we look at how it even influenced the function of a, uh, enzymes like alpha amylase and alpha uh, glucosidase, all those things. But the anti nutritive factor, we had no consider, but we thought that in the near future, we need to look at it and consider what he's saying is true. And if you look at the concentration that he was asking for this initial study, so what we started, they we generally use a, uh, um, one milligram per meal to start with the study to see when, but that was enough to even give us a result because when you compare with that of uh, the control, it was what obvious that they performed better. So with, as they said, on, we continue to do the studies, we can do that to be able to know which amount we should be used. I think we must be wrapping up, but do we have more online? Uh, no, please, um, that's all. Okay, that's, so my colleague will wrap up. Right. Thank you very much, Prof. So on behalf of my co-moderator, I would like to, First of all, thank the presenters for uh, very good presentations. We are, we are most grateful. I think Professor Japon's intervention allowed it to be brought down to a level that most people would appreciate. So thanks to Professor Japon also for that intervention. But we are most grateful. I think you are doing very good work and would like to encourage you to continue. Um, I'm interested in malaria too. And Clearly, it's disturbing that uh, we don't seem to have a lot of options now. So we are hoping that you has can shine the light in the direction for the future so that we can get some new compounds to replace the artemisinins when they have become useless. And also for Ruben, I think uh, your work is also something that needs to continue so that since we are interested in vaccines, uh, I'm particularly worried about EB virus and its interplay with all of these things. When I started off as a, a young medical officer, one of the things which we used to see a lot on the children's wards was Beckett's lymphoma. And it's the same virus which gets mentioned along the line. So it'll be good to see how this plays out in future. Also for Percival and then also for John. Thank you so much for your presentations. I would like to thank all of you for your contributions and your questions. I believe they are available. So if you have any further questions, you can always reach out to them. Thank you so much for your cooperation. Thank you. I think they deserve another round as they descend. So there was a science teacher in one of our secondary schools who was teaching a science topic and the student did not understand. So after the lesson, they decided to now name the teacher after some of the terms she was using. The school is along the coast. So they decided to call this teacher Tazonomi Vanyanya. So they see him everywhere. 
then they whisper, Tazonomi Vanyanya. I'm sure Professor Tagwo can relate. <laughs> and so there's a, it's a school along the coast. And that's where we, we cherish Professor Margaret Japon's intervention. So we can now understand. So those of us hearing the stories, the story can be broken down for us. Thank you so much. It's now time for us to have a health break. It is a 30 minutes health break. Uh, somebody can check the time for us. What's the time? It's 11.30. Going by that time at 12 noon, we will start. We're not coming back at 12 noon. We will start section at 12 noon. The exhibition is currently ongoing. Some of the posters you have seen yesterday have changed. Some have had additions. And so there are new things to see. Uh, let me also announce to you that the COVID testing center, based here in our School of Basic and Biomedical Sciences, have set up a workstation down at the, at the exhibition center where you can do uh, your COVID test and get a result today. And so if you want to try that, you can uh, go there and, and have that done. Uh, so th that's it for, for now. We will run recess quickly for uh, a health break. Stretch around, take your snack, come back and sit, and let us start the next section at 12 noon. Thank you.
so we can begin early. Today is Friday, so let's begin early and end early. And those who want to experience the nightlife of hope can do so before they leave. <laughs> and those who want to travel can, can start their travel early. Let's not sit too far away. Let's let's compact the the front a little. Let it be beautiful on the cameras. That we were many. Those of you scattered there. Just come. 
Don't worry, we are all eating banana. We will join you. It's, it's, nobody has a provision. We are eating, taking some snack or the other. So we'll be fine. If you can just calm down a little. You can still sit together. Just calm down. And let's have a beautiful view. Okay. Yes. So we are beginning another round of oral presentations. And to introduce the moderator to us is Miss Lily Edu Abuaje. I think everybody is done with snacks, so we can clap, right? <laughs> Thank you, MC. Our moderator for the second session is the Dean of School of Nursing and Midwifery. University of Health and Allied Sciences, who, prior to this position, she was the acting dean of School of Nursing and Midwifery, University of Ghana. She is a midwife and a nurse by profession, and also a fellow of the West Africa College of Nursing. She has and continues to teach and supervise both undergraduate and postgraduate nursing students. She has been involved and spearheaded the development of curricula for bachelor's and postgraduate programs at Legon and Lucas. In addition, she is instrumental in the development of a PAD in nursing program, which is to be mounted in the school school soon. Her research interests have been in midwifery and women's health with a focus on female infertility and female cystomiasis. Cystomiasis. She has peer re reviewed publications in both international and local journals. Furthermore, she has chapters in books and a book to her credit. Please, let's welcome Professor Ernestina Donko. Prof, you are welcome. Thank you very much, Lily, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon and welcome from the health break. I hope you've been energized. So you are going to give us your full participation in this. Uh, this section, which is the section two, is going to witness three presentations. So without much ado, I'll call the first presenter to present to us. We are going to, the first one is on assessing the preparedness of health providers to use locally manufactured open fledger microscopes in Ghana, a mixed method approach. So we are going to have Desmond Clue, who is one of the authors, to take us through. Thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon. 
Thank you very much, Prof, for this opportunity. Um, you will notice that um, there has been a slight change um, in the title, but it has not affected the content of my delivery. So before I start, this is a part of a bigger project uh, that Digital Diagnostic for Smarter Healthcare in Africa, which is a collaboration between University of Bath in the UK and UHAS. And basically the aim of this bigger project is to revolutionize digital health and innovation in Africa by training and building the capacity of uh, home-based biomedical engineers to manufacture uh, microscopes here in Ghana. So this is uh, an exploratory study uh, as part of that bigger study. So I'm presenting on assessing the preparedness of health providers to use locally manufactured microscope in Ghana, a mixed method approach. So this is the outline of my presentation from the background to the conclusion and recommendation. So by way of background, uh, medical digital devices, as we all know, are used to diagnose, to monitor, and also to improve patient health. And also anecdotally in Ghana, we know most of these devices are generally imported, but not produced uh, in the country. And one of the challenges that uh, our health providers face in using these uh, devices is the frequent breakdown. And when these uh, devices break down, you do not have uh, the spare parts and also the skilled professionals in our country to come and repair these devices. We usually have to bring the experts from outside or the manufacturers from outside Ghana to do so. And I believe that this uh, thing delays uh, the use of the machine or we can't use the machine at all. And sometimes we leave it uh, abandoned. And when this happens, it affects uh, the quality of healthcare uh, that uh, health providers render. And I'm sure the, af uh, the aftermath of this is death if the, the people can get the uh, quality healthcare. So, uh, University of Bath and uh, UHAS came up and team up to try and uh, empower our local uh, home base biomedical engineers to manufacture uh, these devices from open uh, uh, source hardware. And when this happens, it's likely to increase the availability of the equipment, spare parts will be available. And even if it breaks down, we have the experts here locally to do the maintenance and the repair. So, and also another advantage is that these local engineers would produce these devices to suit our local climate and also uh, be able to work well with local resources. However, there is limited information on how acceptable this will be because this is a new idea and we needed to do some exploratory studies from the stakeholders, those who are going to use the device directly and indirectly to seek their perceptions, their views on this brilliant idea. So we set out to assess the preparedness of the health providers using this. Now, this is a study design. So as it's an exploratory research design, which use mixed method. So we sampled 322 health providers uh, in 12 health facilities across three regions, i.e. Volta, Ashanti, and Upper West to cut across the whole country. And the health providers, we focus on the nurses, physician assistants, doctors in general practice, uh, specialist doctors, as well as uh, lab technician. So we use a structured questionnaire to uh, take, uh, collect information. With regards to the qualitative uh, method, we interviewed 38 experts purposively in the field of medical laboratory, uh, equipment manufacturing, 
clinical research and uh, those institutions or individuals who regulate uh, these medical devices and we use uh, individual in-depth interviews. Ethical clearance was obtained from the UHAS REC, Ghana Health Service, uh, ERC, and University of Bath Social Science uh, Research Ethics Committee. So three uh, institutions gave us ethical clearance for this work. So what are the results? By way of demographics, um, we had majority being nurses, which is expected um, in the health facility that we went to. And also with the uh, IDI participants, we interviewed uh, most of the lab, uh, medical lab scientists because of uh, the nature of what we are studying. So what are some of the results per their uh, perceptions or views uh, on this locally manufactured microscope? Um, more than 50% of them think when microscopes are locally manufactured in Ghana, they will be durable. Um, over three quarters think that when they are being manufactured in Ghana, they will, the spare parts will be available. And also a little above a half of the respondent think that the result that this microscope, locally manufactured microscope will produce will be reliable. And also uh, uh, about 73% think that the cost of uh, repair and maintenance will be very low. So with our uh, dependent variable of interest, uh, you could see clearly that over 97% uh, uh, say that they are ready to use these locally manufactured microscopes. By way of some association, we test some association between the factors and uh, our variable of interest, that is the preparedness. And you will see that uh, indirect users, when I mean indirect users, I'm referring to the nurses, the doctors, uh, and the physician assistant who do not directly use this microscope, but use the results that have been produced from these microscopes. And also the direct users are the lab technicians. So uh, you see clearly that 98% of the indirect users say they are prepared to use microscope uh, as again 89.6% uh, of the in, uh, direct users. And also in terms of the reliability, you could see overwhelming uh, 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 percentage of them think that it's uh, very reliable to use. We also went further to look at some of the predictors of uh, the preparedness of this uh, uh, health provider to use um, locally manufactured microscope. And you will clearly see from the results that uh, the indirect users were more likely uh, to be prepared to use a locally manufactured microscope compared to the direct users, that is the laboratory technicians. And also uh, those who perceive that this locally manufactured uh, microscope will be very difficult to use were less likely to be prepared to use it. And those who also perceive that the cost of uh, repairing and maintaining these devices, uh, the cost of uh, maintaining and repairing these devices uh, will be lower, are less likely to also uh, be prepared to use it. And also the, uh, the, the perception of these uh, health providers on uh, whether these uh, locally based uh, engineers have the financial capacity to produce this result. Those who think they have the financial capacity, they are less likely uh, to be prepared to use these results. So with regards to the qualitative, um, here are some quotes from uh, some of the health providers. I will read the first one. Said, we are prepared to use them. Maybe try the initial ones that will come. We can give them a try and assess whether we can continue to recommend it to the facility to go for it. So clearly, they are yes, they are ready, but they want to be cautious in uh, using it for a uh, healthcare delivery or diagnostic purposes. Uh, another one to also said that health providers would accept to use it, looking at where Ghana Health System even started from and where we are now, things come up to improve the system. So 
we will accept it. So that is one of the quotes from uh, one of the uh, respondents. So what are the key messages from this whole thing I'm saying? Majority, about 97% of the health providers are prepared to use locally manufactured microscopes. And they were also of the view, most of them were of the view that this microscope will be durable and the spare parts will be available for maintenance and repair. And also, as I showed early on in the results, that the indirect users were more prepared to use this uh, locally manufactured microscope than the direct users, that is the who directly use the uh, microscope. So this should tell us something. And also, uh, health providers were, who perceived difficulty in operating uh, these devices are less likely to uh, uh, use it. Again, health providers also believe that, the, uh, who believe that home-based medical uh, or bi uh, bi biomedical engineers who are going to be trained to use to manufacture these devices, who have the financial capacity to use devices, are less likely to use them. So that is a little bit uh, interesting. And also, respondents were also of the view that local, the local production of microscope in Ghana is feasible and will be acceptable. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that health providers in this setting are prepared to use locally manufactured microscopes for healthcare delivery in Ghana, only if they are easy to operate, the cost of repair and maintenance is low, and they will produce accurate results that will meet international standard. So we recommend that the Ministry of Health should consider exploring uh, the local manufacture of microscope in order to ensure improved access to diagnosis and quality of care. I would like to appreciate the UK research and innovation uh, under the UK Global Challenges Fund for funding this project, staff of IHR, University of Bath, and also to uh, Prof. Ansan, Prof. OA, Prof. MG, Dr. Louis Brown, and Dr. Richard Brown for their support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Clu, for presenting your work on uh, assessing health providers preparedness to use locally prepared manufactured microscopes. Please put down your comments, your questions, so that when all the presenters are done, then we can uh, see to those questions. So thank you very much once again. The next presenter is going to present to us on the topic lived experiences of primary caregivers of children under five years of age during the pilot rollout of the RTS malaria vaccine in Ghana, a qualitative locally, uh, lo a qualitative longitudinal study using photo voice. The present presenter, please. Oh, Prof. Okay, Prof. Margaret Japo. So please let's welcome her. There are many authors there, so I didn't know which one it was. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Prof. Yes, there are several authors. Many of them are in Kumasi and Cape Coast. And Evelyn Aqua presented on the first day, and she she begged that I should present this for her. Otherwise, I was going to hold her neck to make her present it. But anyway, I'll go along with this. As soon as it's 10 minutes, please stop me. Thank you. <laughs> so this is the outline um, of the presentation. And um, we all know that uh, this malaria vaccine has been brewing in the lab for a very long time. And following the successful implementation of the vaccine trials in Ghana, Malawi, and Kenya, uh, there was a recommendation that these vaccine or the malaria vaccine should be introduced into routine health system in those three countries. And this should be deployed through the EPI program. 
So this morning we had a lot of IG, pectin, ID, RD1, all kinds of things. And we are told that happens in the lab. And this malaria vaccine had to go through that process before the trials were conducted on humans. And after that was done, there was the need to see how the EPI program could roll it out um, at country level. And we all know that doing conducting studies in a controlled setting is completely different from conducting studies in real life. In the controlled setting, you can tell somebody you can't move from A to B and the person has to be there. But in real life, you can't control a lot of things. Health workers are transferred from A to B. There's policy A today and tomorrow the policy changes. So there was the need to look at how the programs in the different countries were going to roll out this new malaria vaccine. And there was the need to carefully document the processes and the experiences as these vaccines are being rolled out into the health system. Now, for those of us who uh, don't know too much about the vaccination schedules, even though all of us, I believe, have had all our vaccinations as children and growing up, there's a schedule from when you are born right down to when you are about two years of age. And for the purposes of this study uh, that we conducted, the qualitative evaluation study that we did, we were following the process along the line with when children received the vaccination, okay? I talked about the fact that it was going through the routine EPI system. So the, for the malaria vaccine, a child is supposed to receive their first dose at six months. At six months on the regular EPI schedule, a child receives vitamin A in addition at six months, all right? And then, the child is supposed to receive the second dose of the malaria vaccine um, at seven months. And at that point, the child does not get any other regular vaccine. So the child is supposed to be taken to receive the malaria vaccine alone. At nine months, when the child is supposed to receive the third dose, the child is taking that dose with yellow fever and um, measles. And then at 12 months, the child receives vitamin A. And then at 18 months, the child receives meningitis, vitamin A, and other vaccines. And at 24 months, the child is supposed to receive the fourth dose. So we were curious about what happens when the child is receiving the malaria vaccine with other vaccines and when the child is receiving the vaccine alone, and then also when the child has to wait a long period before getting the fourth dose when no other vaccines are happening. So for our study, we were interested in the child at seven months and at 24 months. So what were our research questions? At health system level, we wanted to find out how the vaccination is being implemented and what are the dynamics of implementation? So the health workers are used to giving out vitamin A, measles, whatever it is, but now we are adding the malaria vaccine. How are they navigating their way around it? The how they store the vaccines, how they coordinate, how they do the education. What are the things that they are doing? At the community level, we wanted to find out how the introduction of this uh, new vaccine impacts on household health utilization and how are the mothers and the caregivers and the parents and community members able to process the whole procedure of getting vaccines at strange times along the vaccination schedule. We worked in three regions and these are the same regions where the vaccines were deployed, uh, Brongahafo Central and Volta region. And we selected districts based on information given to us by the regional health directorates um, in terms of access to health care. In the central region, the most rural place we went to, or most hard to reach area was Kushia, very far away. In Bronga Hafo, it was Supong, and the, those from Kintampo may know what I'm talking about. 
And the one that excites me most is the one in the Volta region, Abrewanko. If you are leaving or to go to Abrewanko, you have to wake up at 3 a.m. to be able to get to Dambai and catch the ferry at 8 o'clock. You cross and go to Krachi and do another two hours before you get to Abrewanko. And some of us did that journey two or three times. It was quite exciting what it takes to be able to engage people who are having different interventions. So I've talked briefly about the sampling strategy where we did the work at regional level, we selected districts, and then we went down to the community level. So in each region, we worked in three districts, and in each district, we worked in three communities, and we selected between five to seven primary caregivers per community. On the first day, um, our librarian talked about uh, the lived experience, and she had a small sample size, and there were concerns. There's no way you can do a study, a phenomenological study, use looking at lived experience and have a large sample size because you will not be able to get at the issues very well. So we wanted to find out why people are behaving in a particular way and things are happening in those ways during the rollout of the RTSS malaria vaccine through our EPI system. What data collection uh, techniques did we use? We did ethnographic immersion. Our colleagues went and stayed in these communities before we started collecting any data for eight weeks, trying to understand the context and the community in which these uh, vaccines were deployed. Uh, so we did a community profiling, social mapping. We did the regular data collection techniques that we know. And we did two innovations. So all the other countries, Kenya and Malawi did not do these innovations, but in Ghana, we did the pictorial diary and the photo voice. And for today, I'll be focusing on the photo voice. Our population, primary caregivers, household heads, female elders, community uh, leaders, and health providers. But because I'll be focusing only on photo voice, I'll focus my attention on the primary caregivers alone. It was a qualitative longitudinal approach. So we followed the mothers and their children over a period um, of time. So our objective for the lived experience part of this study was to explore, like it's written, the lived experience of primary caregivers in the context of the introduction of the RTSS malaria vaccine. What did they experience when they had to take their child to the health facility? for the malaria vaccination. Why photo voice? Photo voice is an approach that is recently in re being used um, quite a lot in many studies, but it was initiated in the early 90s by uh, Wang and Boris, and they used it in education. Uh, but it's a participatory approach where you give people cameras for them to take pictures of situations that relate to their own experiences and they discuss and talk about it. Sometimes it's used in studies where you can't get people to talk or express themselves, but as they describe the pictures they are taking, you can tell the way they felt through the pictures that they have taken. For any photo voice study, you need to create scenarios that will allow the people to take the most appropriate pictures. So for this study, we created three scenarios. In the first scenario, we're asking the PCG or the primary caregiver to take pictures of what reflects their experiences with sending their child to, for any immunization before the introduction of the RTSS malaria vaccine. For the second scenario, they were supposed to take pictures of their experiences during and after the first RTSS vaccine which is taken with other vaccinations. And the third scenario, they were supposed to take pictures of their experiences during and after taking the RTSS vaccine. We almost ran into trouble when it came to ethics because um, our funders thought they were going to take pictures of people and show their faces, but that was not the case. You take pictures of objects and not people. And so we got ethical clearance from the Ghana Health Service and the UHAS REC. So when you get to the household of a, a caregiver, you explain the methodology. 
Uh, we bought very simple Android phones. This time we didn't use cameras, but we used phones because we wanted them to be able to call our research assistants if they had any problem. Um, and then we went to them, explained the methodology. Uh, we gave them the camera to take the pictures. And then we went back to them, downloaded the pictures and had a discussion with them about the different pictures they are taking and asked them to select the best picture that describes the way they felt when they took their child for the vaccination. Then they selected the best and I've put some of them together. Now, I, when we went to the primary caregiver, we had an in-depth interview with her and we recorded that. So we had a lot of textual information which was transcribed. We used in vivo and we did thematic um, analysis. My time is up, right? Oh, five minutes, okay, good. So from the discussions that were held, we identified four themes based on a total of 142 photo voice sessions. I'm talking about in the Volta region, Brongahafo and Central, uh, with 56 primary caregivers, uh, age ranging between 17 to 44 years. The numbers look huge, but it's because we've pulled from all the three sides together. The main themes were around acceptance of the vaccine and the procedures, concerns about the vaccination, the healthcare system, and their experience over time. And we put this in a map. So for qualitative research and for phenomenology, you have your map to be able to show where the themes are. So these are the four themes I talked about. It's not showing. There's no point. Okay. So the concerns, the acceptability, the health system issues, and their reactions um, over time. So um, I'll pick some of the pictures that they have taken and the transcription around what the picture was telling us about. The first one was fear, expression of fear. And we've coded who the respondents are so that we will not know um, who, we cannot link the data to the individuals. So one person said there were rumors about the RTSS malaria vaccine that is, is for family planning and our children when vaccinated will not be able to give birth. I was scared and thought if I vaccinated my child, she will look like these dry flowers. The colors are not showing very well, but she took a picture of um, a shrub, which was very shriveled. And we asked why she said she's afraid that her child is going to get shriveled if the child takes the vaccination because of rumors that she was hearing about the vaccination. One person expressed regret. She said, that day when we went for weight and returned within the shortest time, I was very high. In fact, as hot as fire, my sister, I have to be frank with you. Although my mother-in-law has been admonishing me about the importance of the vaccines, for this time around, I regretted taking her for weighing. And she's taking a picture of the fire for, for us to see. So yes, they know they have to go, but the experience after taking the vaccination was painful and stressful for them, and they regretted it. However, some of them really trusted the health system. I see the child welfare clinic as an assurance that my child can have good health, just as the motorbike, which is the only means of transport in my community, that gives me assurance that I can get access to healthcare whenever my child is not well. So they kind of trust the health system, but the way their child feels after the vaccination is what disturbs them quite a bit. But then we talked about looking at issues over time. And I pulled out the data from one primary caregiver over the different waves to show some of the experiences that she had. So this first person at the first scenario, she said, I think the vaccines are good for the children because it protects them from diseases. But from my house to the hospital is quite far and walking through the scorching sun only to get there and be told you are late. So go back and come the following day. It has made me reluctant to go there. It has become a burden, like a pile of firewood which has to be carried all the way from the farm to the house. So that's a pile of firewood there. 
you spend time going to the health facility and then they tell you, you didn't come early. So we have closed, go and come back. And can you imagine how that feels? The next one, the same person going for the second round of vaccinations. I'm a young mother of three children. And even though I don't have a job, taking care of three children is a huge responsibility. My house is far away from the hospital. So walking all the way there is a challenge for me. And recently too, I had to undergo surgery. All these makes it difficult for me to attend weighing. So I even missed some of the vaccinations for my daughter. The last time I went to the hospital, it wasn't even for weighing, but they gave my daughter three vaccine shots, including the new malaria vaccine. And she has been sick since that day. I'm not against vaccines, but when it becomes such a burden, it makes me feel like an overloaded track. So because the child had missed some of the earlier vaccines, when she brought the child, they had to load her with every other thing she had missed. And that was a bit of a problem for her. The last picture I'm going to show, if you cannot look at reptiles, don't look at it. It's good VC is not here because he would have walked out. I'm going to show a picture of a snake. So if you cannot look at it, then you can close your eyes. So for her third visit, she said, my experience with the malaria vaccine is really a bad one. <laughs> I didn't want my child to take the vaccine in the first place, but I did it because my husband said so. Since then, my child has had several episodes of diarrhea and it continued after she took the second one. I have decided that I won't even go for weighing again. It feels like a poisonous snake lying in wait for me over there. This is a snake. Some showed us pictures of a scorpion. Some, there are so many pictures. But ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to show is that using pictures um, helps to get at some of the most innermost feelings of some of the people we engage with at the community level. And we've presented this to the EPI program and they are looking at some of the issues that relate to taking uh, women taking their children uh, for healthcare services. To conclude, I think there's a need for us to build trust and confidence in vaccine safety um, and effectiveness. Yes, there were rumors, but these vaccines are safe. And there's a way we need to really encourage these mothers um, to take these vaccinations. And our healthcare providers must also remain um, accountable. I don't know how many of our district uh, people are here, but they are concerned about the way we relate to our, um, our clients. And it is something that has come up over and over again. The study provides a lot of rich contextual information. So there's a quantitative aspect of this study and there are several numbers, but you cannot draw any conclusions or a lot of conclusions from the numbers. And we think that this approach helps us to get out a lot of contextual information um, for the um, future scale up of the new malaria vaccine. Like I said earlier on, this has been a collaborative work and we have all the team members there. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Prof. Margaret Japon. It was becoming interesting, but I realized she was you know, going beyond the time, but she managed to, to, to give us the information that we needed. Another round of applause for her, please. Thank you very much. Um, the last presentation is on early life factors and their relevance for mothers of cardiometabolic risk in early adulthood. The presenter, please. There are many of them. Which one, whose name should I mention? The first one, Dr. Dr. Nyasoji. Thank you. Uh, I'm Juliana Nyasoji, and I'm presenting on early life factors and their relevance for markers of cardiometabolic risk in early adulthood. So I'm from the nutrition and dietetics department. So the outline of my presentation 
And I want to find out if there's any relationship between uh, the picture of an obese pregnant woman and some epigenetic modifications of the child that we'll see in later life. So by way of introduction, we know that uh, non-communicable diseases have increased over the recent decades. And there've been a lot of interventions such as weight reduction, uh, optimal dieting, reducing smoking, and a host lot of factors to be able to reduce the burden of non-communicable diseases, especially cardiovascular, diabetes, hypertension, and then the rest. And it's been taught that NCDs are mostly adulthood diseases who have their risk factors, especially in adulthood. So with aging, people become, if I may use the word, senescence, and then they are able to develop some of these non-communicable diseases. Uh, but another school of thoughts way back during the early 20th century by one scientist, uh, Professor David Barker, uh, when he studied data linkages, there was this registry that has taken note of birth weight of children in England. And then later, they realized that in that same area, there was a lot of uh, mortalities among the aged, 60, 70 years from cardiovascular diseases and NCDs in general. So they did a data linkage. That is one useful usefulness of data when you can link it up. So they were able to link birth registry data with some mortality data in the same region. And then they realized that in the same cohorts, children who were born having low birth weight had the tendency of dying from cardiovascular diseases in later life. They concluded that maybe low birth weight was, and low birth weight and then excessive weight gain during the first few years of life within one year catch-up group was maybe making this adult susceptible to cardiovascular disease. And that NCDs were not solely due to adulthood lifestyle factors, but in fact, the womb could also be a risk factor. Adverse conditions in the womb could also be an adverse factor. So in that era, low birth weight was the main exposure they were interested in. But of course, with any new hypothesis, there's always the raffle, no, it can be the womb. It can be factors that were in childhood and then 20 years later, they would be having effects on the children. But in those few decades, 20, 30 years, there'd been a lot of research evidence that is showing that indeed early life factors could be relevant risk factors of cardiometabolic diseases in adulthood. And our attention has shifted from low birth weight to uh, suboptimal nutritional uh, levels, even farming conditions. So the Dutch farming, for instance, that era, when children who were still incubated in the womb or mothers who were pregnant and then experienced the farming, and then after birth, they are children, they follow them up over a long period and realize that yes, indeed, adverse early life exposures could also be relevant for some cardiometabolic diseases. So as I wanted to show you on that cartoon, uh, for instance, uh, some maternal factors that have been looked at, uh, uh, GDM, gestational diabetes, or hyperglycemia, excessive weight gain, obesity, and then stress, poor nutrition, low levels of physical activity. So they have a way of modifying the epigenome of the child, such that the child might be susceptible to overweight or obesity. That also has its own linkage with non-communicable diseases, dyslipidemia, early onset of diabetes, and then the adulthood overt manifestation of diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. So all this goes to uh, give some credence to the fact that uh, early life factors are relevant for cardiometabolic disorders in later adulthood. And yes, genetics of an individual, the current environment we are in, fast foods, obosogenic environment. In fact, it warrants weight gain. So they could all be contributing, but yes, developmental origins could also lead to adverse exposures. So there are two main hypotheses, which we call the fetal origins of adulthood diseases 
or developmental origins of adult food disease. And the pioneer of this hypothesis is David Barker. So in that premise, uh, we set out to look at uh, some cohort studies that is being carried out uh, in, post, in Dortmund, Germany, uh, which is called the Donald Study. Uh, it's an acronym of uh, Dortmund Nutrition and Anthropometric Longitudinally Designed Study. So as you can see that, uh, I wish I had a pointer. So there are various uh, examination points. Children are mostly uh, recruited when they are three months after birth, then they go for a series of examinations. So for the first three months, they will go for uh, nutritional assessments, they go for medical record, dietary records, a host of uh, recording before uh, non-invasive measurements. So yearly they would go for, when they are second year, they will go twice. Then they go annually until when they are 18 years where blood measurements and blood assessments will take place. The parents are also examined uh, regularly as their children attend such uh, sessions in the study. So we analyze a population of 348 stem born uh, uh, infants. And in this study, uh, low birth weight children and children with malfunctioning or any disease uh, conditions were excluded, both in, in childhood and then in adulthood. And what was our main aim? We hypothesized that indeed different exposures in early life may be relevant for markers of cardiometabolic risk in young adulthood. And some of the, uh, we assess prospective association of a varied range of early life factors. And then we sought, we looked at the relationship that it had with markers of cardiometabolic risk. Why are we using markers? Uh, in fact, it takes, there's a very long duration between childhood and then adulthood. So the onset, and in this our population, these are just young adults. There is no overt manifestation of these cardiovascular diseases or conditions. That's why we are looking at the risk markers, which are also very key and important. So some of the exposures we looked at, for instance, was childbirth and maternal characteristics that we abstracted uh, from the mutapas. Mutapas is just like the ordinary uh, pregnancy record book we, we use here in Ghana. We calculated gestational duration. Uh, we also looked at start and end of pregnancy uh, weight. We calculated uh, gestational weight gain. We look at maternal and paternal age, and then birth weight, birth weight for gestational age, breastfeeding, and then exposure to smoke. Uh, in other countries, there are a lot of smoking. So if in a household there are smokers, the child could be exposed to smoke. So we also assess that and then parental education. So these are some of the exposures we look at. But donor studies is a big study. I, we were just interested in a few of this. And then we categorize this exposures into exposures before the child was born, exposures when the child was in the womb, and then exposure when the child was delivered. So we'll get to see. And then some of the outcome variables or our dependent variables. So they also took uh, fasting blood glucose measurement, insulin levels, triglyceride level, and then liver transaminases, uh, and then some inflammatory cytokines. And then from this, we were able to generate some four outcome. We looked at insulin sensitivity. We looked at hepatic steatosis index, we look at fatty liver index and then pro-inflammatory score. All these were done with statistical calculation from the routine blood measurements that were done. For pro-inflammatory score, it was more meaningful to have an aggregate score. We first standardized the cytokines before aggregating them. So that it gives us a score that is more representative of inflammation. So some statistical analysis. So we built multivariable regression models. Uh, we tested for cess uh, differences. So for instance, in males and females, uh, our results behaving differently. If there's a sex interaction, it means males are presenting different results and females are presenting different results. Then we did a sex stratified analysis. So for our exposure, gestational weight gain, and then insulin sensitivity, there was a significant sex interaction. So we did analysis separately for men and then separately uh, for females. 
we also adjusted for our covariates in a hierarchical manner. So we picked pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, childhood, and then adulthood factors. And then we also did identical adjustments. So for instance, outcome variables that are similar, for instance, fatty liver index, hepatic steatosis index, they are similar variables. So to be able to enhance comparability of our results, we adjusted for them identically. And then we also built conditional models uh, to be able to see if we are seeing an association between our outcome and our exposure. Is it explained solely by those two factors or there's a mediating factor of the child? That is why we are seeing those exposures. We also, if there is a, a conditional model, then we also want to test the level of mediation. So we'll do a causal mediation analysis. So that is the statistics. So in, by way of our results, these are just some of the characteristics of our participants. Uh, maternal uh, BMI, and you could see that these were mostly normal women, not too overweight women, and then gestational weight gain, and then the durations of breastfeeding among our population. So for our first exposure, maternal early pregnancy BMI and how it relates to fatty liver index, we saw that as maternal BMI increased, so did the child's uh, fatty liver increase from around 25 years onward. So high early pregnancy BMI was linked to a higher fatty liver index. And we also said that in this association, when we add waist circumference or any measures of adiposity, then the association is attenuated or it's no longer relevant. That gives us an indication of mediation. So we tested for indeed mediation, and then we realized that it was highly mediated by offspring adiposity represented by the waist circumference. The same vein, we see the same picture with BMI and then uh, hepatic steatosis index, also heavily mediated by offspring uh, waist circumference. We see a similar trend with pro-inflammatory score, also heavily mediated. However, in terms of insulin sensitivity, we saw that as maternal BMI increased, the offspring insulin sensitivity decreased, and this was also a bit mediated. So our second exposure variable, gestational weight gain, so we saw that we saw the same picture running through that as maternal gestational weight gain during pregnancy increased, so did this uh, cardiometabolic risk factors also increase and they were also mediated. And our last variable we checked was breastfeeding. We realized that breastfeeding was linked to a lower fatty liver index, especially the longer duration of breastfeeding, which spans over 17 weeks. And in Germany, they don't do exclusive breastfeeding, they do full breastfeeding, which means the child is eating water and tea, not solely, and, and breastfed just for four months compared to what we do here in six months. So in terms of discussion, yes, uh, we've seen that our early life factors are relevant, especially uh, maternal, uh, early pregnancy BMI was strongly associated with the cardiometabolic risk factors compared to gestational weight gain. This is of public health importance and we need to be disseminating uh, this information that it's important to put some consideration on preconception and pregnancy obesity. We're also supposed to be promoting healthy diet and weight and encourage physical activity during preconception and then pregnancy and as well as promote uh, breastfeeding. So NCD pre prevention should use an integrated and a life course approach and not just focus on the adulthood years. We also should be thinking about optimizing the early environment that the child would be growing in both maternal factors in utero and then the early life years of the child in view of reducing uh, disease risks. So some of the strength of our study is that it's just a cohort longitudinal study that followed from childhood, three months, six months, up until 25 years thereabout. We also assess a range of markers of cardiometabolic risk factors. It was also potential confounders were also prospectively assessed. But the limitation of the study is it's an observational study. So of course we can't draw causal conclusions and a relatively small sample size because these are just the numbers that have got into adulthood that are still in the study that we've looked at. So in conclusion, we see that maternal early pregnancy BMI, especially 
So the weight before the pregnancy, very, very key to some of these cardiometabolic uh, risk markers. But the associations, that's the good one. It's mediated by the offspring adiposity. So we can work using lifestyle modification factors. I want to appreciate God for the strength he's giving me to go through my PhD studies. And also, I also want to very sincerely thank my father who spared me on to do a PhD. But sadly, two weeks to my defense, he passed on. But I know he's smiling wherever he is. I also want to thank my mom, my supervisor, and especially the DAD Ghana government collaboration that gave sponsorship for this work. I also want to thank the organizers of this forum to be able to present this data. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nyasoji. Thank you very much. Oh, you, you could see that all our presentations have been very exciting. You know, at that point, I didn't know how to stop them. See, anyway, I hope you bear with me. So we've had uh, presentations on um, locally manufactured microscopes, uh, pilots rollout of the RTSS malaria vaccine in Ghana, and then the last one, the fact that early life factors are relevant for markers of cardiometabolic cardio uh, risk in early adulthood. Please, the floor is now open for your comments, your contributions, and then your questions. That we, we have many hands there. Can you please help us? Oh, you, you, you oh. said there. Oh, it's okay. You can start from. Can. It looks like we have we have many hands. So, <laughs> oh. yes. Uh, so I will come to the last presenter. Very interesting uh, results you have shown. Actually, my reason for asking this is. To generate this kind of data, it takes a very long time. Why is here? What is your plan in terms of uh, a longitudinal study that will you be able to follow uh, people from childhood to adulthood and build? I think you ended by saying your, your numbers were small. I wish you had a very uh, emphatic resource based on uh, following a population over time. Do you have any such plans or you just wanted to uh, have your PhD from this work and leave it there? I will be chasing you from here. So, yes, it's, it's not easy to do a longitudinal study. And most of these studies were collaborations uh, between different organizations, the Diabetes Center, some looking at different blood measurements and all that. I didn't just want to get a PhD from this. So I have plans of maybe looking at some data linkages first, looking at some trends first. If, I develop the capacity to write good grants and I'm able to get good grants, then <laughs> that's a possibility. Thank you very much. Other questions? Uh, thank you very much. My observation is about uh, the microscope. <clears throat> local uh, assemblage of a microscope. And um, I look at your uh, the content, actually, of your presentation. It appears that the content of your presentation is actually not coterminous with the title of your topic. I'm worried about that. And I wanted to look at it, whether you, what you did in my opinion, I don't want to tell you, but is it about preparedness or is it about impression? That is one. Then one of your variables 
you need to go and look at it. It, to me, it is asking people to answer what is not there. But when we talk about durability, I don't think for a microscope that has not been manufactured or used, I don't think if you ask me about durability, I'll be able to tell you about it. Durability is about how well can that thing continue to do what it has to do. So maybe you look at it, but my major concern is the content of your work and the title of your work that are not coterminous. Maybe you want to look into that. Thank you. You want to respond? He will respond. Thank you very much. So, um, yes, um, um, that is one of the issues when you went to the field because this is something that has not happened. It, is, it was an idea. But the people we went to have been using microscopes before. So we are just, the only difference is that we are saying this one will be assembled here, right here in Ghana by trained uh, home based biomedical scientists. So we are only looking at their perception that if this microscope are assembled here in Ghana, based on experience of using microscope, do you think that they will be durable? as the one that you are using, looking at those people, uh, the local uh, or home-based trained people who are going to do the assembling or the manufacturing. So I, I understand a uh, respondent also raised that question that we have not used it before. So how can we give an honest opinion about the durability? But we just wanted to know that this is something they are going to bring in, but we want to have an idea of what they think about it. Next one, please. My question goes to Dr. Oklu. Um, well, it was a beautiful presentation, except for a few um, issues I have with it. Um, your answer to Prof's question just now, I mean, I presume you know that it is the lab technicians who mostly use the microscopes. But when you were projecting your data, I realize the constituted 14% of your, I mean, what was the reason for just taking a few of those who would actually be able to, I mean, are going to use the microscopes and have experiences using microscopes? Thank you very much. Um, so we set the health facilities we selected. Um, when we went to the health facility, we selected four levels, a regional hospital, a district or municipal hospital, a polyclinic, and a health center with a lab. So generally, most of the labs have few numbers, but we, do not, we did not want to concentrate only on the lab technician, but we also want to get the views of the other health providers who read the results uh, produced by these microscopes. So when we went to the field, um, most of the health providers that we met was, were nurses in their large numbers. But for the lab technicians, there were only few, to be honest. Let me, let me add to that. Um, if you look at the title, we're talking about digital diagnostics. It could be microscopes. It could be other things. OK, so well, th those were the issues. We conducted some of the interviews. Yes with the te technicians, we went to technologists in addition, and we spoke to um, other people in addition. Okay, thank you very much for the presentations. Um, I think it's a follow-up to, to Dr. Oklu as well. Um, you indicated that the indirect users, as you just mentioned, were, as in they prefer to use the local ones as compared to direct users, that's the, those who are working in the lab. And they should tell us something. I want to know what it is telling you. Is it a normal insertion desire for foreign products? And if it's like that, what would you do intend to do to be able to solve that problem before we can even think about going to manufacture and all that? Thank you. So um, if you notice, uh, what we did was that for the lab technician, they are head. We did a qualitative interview um, with them. And what they are saying is that um, the, for the locally manufactured microscopes, these are things they are going to use to diagnose diseases. So 
um, they cannot just start uh, using it in their labs. So they were a little bit reluctant that if possible, if these uh, biomedical engineers produce these microscopes, uh, they should even start using it in uh, health and uh, the schools and other labs or research institutions for us to see the outcome before rolling it out to uh, the main health facilities. So I think that might be the reason why they, uh, compared to the indirect users, they are a bit cautious uh, in a, a whole, solely accepting it uh, to be used. Okay. So my question is to Prof. Um, I was just amazed at the level of intelligence that this, um, the, the respondents um, were able to um, express through the photos and, and relating it to their inner feelings as you rightly um, uh, displayed. Um, but just thinking about the fact that these were people who um, are coming from uh, rural areas, uh, and one can easily assume that their socioeconomic status may be made up to a bit low. How did the team prepare them to be able to um, um, correctly relate their um, inner feelings by giving the right pictorial um, description to what they, they wanted to, to put across? Thank you very much. Um these are perceptions of primary caregivers. This is what they think. This is how they felt. I cannot say whether what they are saying is right or wrong. It wasn't a structured questionnaire asking them to rank whether this is right or wrong. But basically, it took quite a bit of time to train them to understand what we're looking out for. And it was the scenarios that we had this, um, described as I presented. So we went scenario by scenario. When we go, you, when I showed the chart, I showed we went in waves, three waves, yes. So we go for wave one, we take the first scenario, we explain to the mother what we want them to get. Some of them brought pictures of friends and relatives, we said no. We said, what your, the way you feel or the way you felt when you took your child to the vaccination, not people, anything, any object, and they brought several, okay? And sitting with them and going back over the scenario, we asked, so all these pictures that you took, which of them best describes the way you felt when you took? So it's their innermost feeling, their lived experience, their experience. I cannot say, I wasn't there when they went, so I cannot judge whether what they are saying is correct or wrong, but this is what they are expressing through the pictures that they took. Are you okay? Any further questions, please? To Dr. Okulu, can you uh, tell us what type of microscope you were actually examining? Uh, there are different types of microscope user. And uh, is it the ordinary light microscope or electro, uh, what about, uh, electro microscope? Is it a... Uh, uh, UV microscope. What, I mean, what what do you actually look at? Okay, thank you. So this, um, the for the larger project, the part, the focus was on digital microscopes, uh, which is uh, open Fletcher 3D printed microscopes. And that is what we were lo uh, uh, looking at. Yes, but the question was not on that particular one. We we wanted to just explore about microscopes, but for the training and the production, it will be the uh, digital microscopes. And uh, if, if they manufacture this locally, is it going to infringe any copyright, uh, sorry, uh, patent rights? And have you explored any starting around it? Well, um, not yet, we, we are still, uh, exploring other aspects. In fact, we uh, talked to uh, Ghana Standard Authority, the regulators. We are still engaging them to know um, what the manufacturers are supposed to do. You know, the right steps and procedures and uh, SOP they are supposed to follow to manufacture this. And uh, this is from an open source uh, that they can 
assemble this and manufacture. So the presumption is that it will meet that international standard. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll receive one question and then we'll go to line and then we'll come back to you again. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, my question is to the gentleman as well, um, but I'm also making a general observation, the qualitative aspect. I noticed that almost all those who presented on qualitative studies with the exception of a few, present just the dominant opinions. We don't get divergent um, um, opinions. I, I, it's, it's, I mean, it's not very normal that when you do such studies, um, people would seem just to be saying things that fall in line with, with, with what you want to see. You also expect to see people who deviate from, from the norm. And I don't see um, deviant opinion presented in throughout all the qualitative, almost all the qualitative studies that were presented. So in your case, did people, did you have people having different opinions and, and what were the reasons for that? Certainly, they had uh, different opinions. Um, some were skeptical about the quality of the results, um, whether this will really, is, whether it is sustainable and whether it will be used widely as we are envisaging. So there were other um, opinions that people express that shows that they are not fully prepared to embrace this as uh, the, the, uh, the whole project wants it to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. It looks like it's becoming very interesting. But uh, uh, the online, and then we'll come here. It looks like those here are complaining. It looks like now we are receiving questions from there. So after the online questions, we'll attend to those here, please. So uh, the online questions. Okay, so um, there are a few questions online. I'll read them out so that our presenters will answer them accordingly. Okay. So um, the first the first one is a comment from Prof. Amona. Uh, it goes to uh, Prof. Marge Japon. He says, uh, Prof. Marge Japon has given an excellent expose of qualitative research methodology and also introduced us to innovations such as photo voice using phenomenology research. I hope we are all learning from this brilliant exposition. I hope students of qualitative research will gain some insights from this presentation. Thank you, Prof. I hope there will be other opportunities to share this with faculty and students. And then secondly, to Dr. Nyasoji, he says, a good presentation by Dr. Nyasoji on early life origins of adult cardiometabolic disease. I think regarding the observational nature of the study, as a limitation is not right. Surely you had, you had research questions which that type of research design was meant to answer. The fact that casual links could not be established should not be a limitation, especially given the evidence that has been gathered over the last century on the developmental origins of disease. I suggest we should establish a birth cohort in communities in the Volta region and to follow them up the Binka School of Public Health has started some work in identifying and working with districts in the Volta region. There is opportunity for collaboration. Well done with the project. And then to Dr. Klu, he says, Dr. Klu, you mean microscopes assembled by biomedical engineers, not biomedical scientists. Thanks. Dr. Pius Mensa also says, Dr. Klu, please, have these locally assembled microscopes been used and the results compared with standards and then Jonathan Jato is giving a clarification here that most of the microscopes in these projects are open labware, and there are no IP rights except just recognizing the source of info for building the instrument. I think that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comments online. Thank you very much. So maybe we, we can uh, move on to our questions. Where is the mic, please? Let's have it here. Okay. My question goes to uh, Dr. Oklu. 
Um, I don't know why you included uh, indirect users to the data. Is it that for them to trust the results they receive? I don't know. So if you can explain, I thought you could have concentrated only on the direct users. Thank okay. you. So thank you very much. Um, the, uh, the whole project is on uh, digital diagnostic devices. How uh, we will train biomedical engineers to produce it. We are only using the microscope as an entry point, as a start. So uh, this is just part of something I came out of the, or I took out of the data. So we ask question on general devices. So that is why we included the indirect users. So we ask question on other de medical devices that uh, whether they think producing it here in Ghana is something feasible, whether they are prepared to do it. That is why we included other um, health providers and not concentrate only on the um, um, laboratory technicians. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. Um, I want to say a big thank you to all the three presenters. Uh, I think the content was rich with information. Uh, with regards to Dr. Oklu's presentation, um, to some extent, some of the questions might be coming because of the context and maybe how the information was conveyed. But communicating with him uh, along the lines in the course of doing this study, the idea is to test more on willingness to accept, I mean, a medical equipment of this nature if it were to be locally manufactured. You know, I guess if that caveat was made from the beginning, it detailed some of these questions that are coming through. Um, to Prof. Japon's presentation, I think that was brilliant. But my question is, did you experience any attrition rate in giving out the Android phones? Because I can imagine if I was part of this participant, I could have told you it's missing and you don't get it back. Did you experience those kind of things? The last one to the nutritionist. What is your opinion on exclusive breastfeeding today as we speak in our part of the world? Because I know there are some Western countries that this concept is completely new to them. And you even alluded to part of it in, in Germany. But from the expert point of view, what do you make of exclusive breastfeeding? Thank you. All the phones were returned. They were simple, very simple Android phones. And we said it's just for the purpose of this. So they were all. Return. In fact, in some of the communities, we left it at the health center. The committees were, the houses were quite close. Um, so if you needed it, some of them had their own phones, which for which they took the pictures. But we have all the phones. Thank you for your question. I think exclusive breastfeeding, it's reducing in Ghana. Just like with all the interventions from uh, donors, when though it's sort of integrated into our health system, but of course, when funds then is not available to push it, then that becomes the sustainability becomes a problem. And in literature, <laughs> exclusive breastfeeding, when you start to adjust for some maternal confounding factors, you don't see the benefits again. Uh, some literature have reported. But of course, in our settings, exclusive breastfeeding is key because of the malaria, because of diarrhea, ear infection, and some of, th some of the things that are associated with feeding with other food from the very early stages of life. So I think exclusive breastfeeding is key because it provides the antibodies that a child needs to be able to build its immune system from the colostrum in the breast milk. So Exclusive breastfeeding is key, and I think it should be promoted. But of course, we need more sensitization to increase the levels in the mothers. With the outside world, some of the hygienic problems we will be facing here if we were feeding with infant formulas or locally manufactured from the very early stages, they might not have that uh, challenge. For instance, our water sources are not so conducive because of contaminations and other things. So I think exclusive breastfeeding is very re relevant to our setting for the six months, and then we should maintain and promote it 
in our societies. I made some controversial remarks that I know. <laughs> Any further questions, comments? Please, my question is to Prof. Japon. Yes, in terms of literature, when you look at the broader literature, when you start controlling for some maternal factors, there's a dose response such that, well, if the children are breastfed for a longer duration, the benefit seems to be, of course, better compared to shorter duration. So in most of the shorter durations, when you start controlling for some covariates, you don't begin to see the benefits of breastfeeding at all. That is why in the Western world, I'm not speaking for them, but because of, uh, I mean, the nature of development and the adequate levels of infant formulas that have been fortified with a lot of nutrients, they could afford to say we are breastfeeding for four months. They don't have issues of sanitation as we have. That's the controversy. Please, are you okay? <laughs> Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Prof. Ofori is here. Please, where is the mic? Please. Ah, thank okay. thank you for the okay. presentation. Please go ahead. But my question is to Prof. Japon. Prof. Japon. Um, I would like to know, um, it looks like the studies on malaria vaccine is being done in rural settings. I don't know if we are doing some in urban areas where the people are a little bit educated than uh, our brothers and sisters back in the rural setting, and then the likelihood of they not accepting the vaccine, whether that has been done, I would like to know. Thank you for that. For, for the malaria vaccine uh, studies, like I mentioned earlier on, we purposively worked in the areas, the three areas uh, where the country is rolling out uh, the, the vaccine, all right? And there are different levels. For instance, if you take the Volta region, we worked in Pando, which is a slightly more urban area than Abrewanko and um, the other places that we worked in. So if you look at the, the table that I showed, there were various levels of access. Those who have easy access to health facilities, which were the slightly more urban areas than those who had poor um, access. And the data I presented is from ACROS. The, the issue about the urban areas was um, issues to do with acceptability and, you know, some of the district health uh, management teams were complaining about getting them together, getting them to be able to adhere to some of the things they were talking about. In the rural areas, it's more it's smaller, more homogeneous groups, and they were able to get to talk to uh, people and get them to accept things much better. Uh, it's it's interesting to note that in Abrewanko, where access to healthcare is very very difficult, they had the highest immunization coverages, and it's because of the community workers in the place. So the health workers depended on these community workers who would announce to the mothers to stay at home, so that when the health workers came, the mothers could get their children to get their vaccinations before they would go anywhere. In Pando, the health team complained, no matter what you did, you had to struggle, they won't come on time, so many things, because they were busy doing um, other things. Thank you. Yes, one question for each, but uh, to uh, Julie first. Um, what were some of the challenges beside the um, limitations that you, you gave. What are some of the challenges you encountered during this longevity, uh, 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 the study that you did? Now, if we were also to replicate it here, you want to do normative study in Ghana. And so for, I believe the samples, all your samples were white, isn't it? So if we want to do the, uh, the same study here, what are some of the challenges you anticipate to? Uh, encounter from experience from your your way. So then to the gentleman too. I'm looking at we are talking about instrumentation, and to me the focus should be on the the quality of the microscope or whatever instrument that is coming. So possibly there will be need to rather do a comparative study of 
the qualities of the microscope, those assembled locally to compare to those outside. Because if you are looking at the preference, I think it will be more social. Ghanaians, as we are, our taste has changed. We prefer even everything, we have the perception that everything outside is better than if it's done locally. So it's more of perception views than the quality of the equipment, whether it's assembled local or not. So maybe if we want to introduce this project, it's better to have equipment produced outside or assembled outside, similar equipment for the manufacturer assembled here, then we can taste its consistency, reliability, and the ability to give you the correct resources and so on. Then we can compare and say that based on this equipment here is better and uh, to be used than that. But if we want to uh, just say, would you prefer equipment assembled here than that? Obviously, we know the answer already. Majority of Ghanaians artists is for foreign, even though the foreign one may not guarantee quality. I, I, I'm not asking the question, but I want to uh, support Dr. Clue because uh, I think there are a couple of issues that have not been put in context. One, the study that was carried out was more of an exploratory study. Thinking before things happen. How acceptable is it going to be? Using the microscope as an example. But as he mentioned, there were other instruments that could have been considered. But we use the microscope. One, because we found out that in terms of the challenges we have in using these instruments, microscope stood out. You, you import a microscope. And in the course of its use, you don't get spare parts. Sometimes you don't even get uh, technicians that are able to fix it for you. So it becomes a white elephant. You've thrown away your money. If this is where we are, our minds should focus, if by the assessment of the Ghana Standards Authority on instruments like the microscope that is imported, if they do not find that to be what is manufactured locally, to be comparable with what is imported, are we getting it? Where parts to fix, where technicians to fix the parts needed, and all those things are provided, would you would that be receptive to you? I think those are the practical questions that are being asked. There will be the opportunity to compare what is imported and what is being used locally, maybe by the users and users of these things. Do you get what I mean? But invariably, the Ghana Standards Authority is looking, I mean, it's making an assessment before the, the ones that they are trying to manufacture in country is out in the market to be used. So we, we shouldn't let it look like uh, we have microscopes from outside, we have microscopes locally manufactured, and what is your preference? Based on your experience, the difficulties you've had replacing parts, getting somebody who is an expert. Do you get it? Will you consider using something that is locally manufactured? But I should emphasize that it's exploratory at this stage. We are not, the scientists who did this work are not the ones going to manufacture the microscope. The microscope, at least as an example in Ghana, was uh, being manufactured by a group in uh, Kumasi who we related with at some point. I just wanted to make this contribution. So, Prof, thank you for your question. I think some of, 
the challenges were because it's a longitudinal study and for they were recruiting just about 35 to 40 uh, young children every year. I think the sample size to sustain such interest into a long study period was problematic. And then also as with adolescents, studies with adolescents are very shaky. So in the beginning, the parents have given consent and know that as they get older, maybe they don't want to continue with the study or they've moved out from where they are. So this was some of the challenge, but it's in phases where they do studies on children, infants, up to when they are young adults. So when we come to Ghana, maybe thinking loud, if we could get the health institutions to select pregnant women before they even give birth. And then uh, with community health nurses who could help us uh, trace these people and maybe get a consent. Will you be in this village or for so so and so period of time? Or if you are moving out, can you let us know to follow you up? Those are some of the thoughts that I have. Thank you very much. I learned that uh, online, a question from online. So please, can we have the online? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Donko. Uh, and thank you, colleagues, for such a wonderful session. Um, I just wanted to make a comment, and I don't think we need a response to the comment because uh, Dr. Nyasoji actually did try to correct herself by talking about the importance of exclusive breastfeeding. I am forced to intervene because as a nutritionist, I know how long it has taken us to fight the formula industry regarding infant feeding. And even at one point, there was this impression that the formula that was being produced was better than or equal to breast milk. It is not true that exclusive breastfeeding after some time becomes less effective. It is prolonged breastfeeding that may be inadequate to meet the energy and nutrient needs of the child or the infant as they are growing beyond six months. Exclusive breastfeeding, the six month period is something that was based on a lot of work and effort what we should be doing as nutritionists, rather than to you know, sort of use literature that may be from a different demographic, from a different environment, different cultures, where their infant feeding practices may not necessarily be the type that should be optimum, is to discourage the use of such selected or selective literature for uh, making any arguments. It causes confusion. Now, if you note the WHO growth standards that were developed based on six countries from across the world, including data collected from Ghana, was based purely on exclusively breastfed infants and children. The whole idea was to make sure that we get accurate information about optimum growth for young uh, infants and children. So please, uh, we need to be very, very careful as professionals and practitioners and educators when it comes to this issue. We have fought the food industry for decades. I have been involved in this fight in the United Kingdom and across the continent. And so it is unfortunate that we should even suggest for a moment that exclusive breastfeeding may not be as effective with time. We know the impact of artificial feeding, especially in our part of the world where sometimes portable water may not be available. People use uh, feeding bottles that are not well kept and there are no proper storage facilities to control for bacteria growth and children get diarrhea and they die from diarrhea diseases. So please, I am, I'm, 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 I'm very passionate about this and I want us as colleagues to be very careful when it comes to this issue, because it is not just a controversy you have said. 
you have actually given information that can be misinterpreted. And we have to avoid that at all costs as professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Amuna. Uh, Dr. Nyasoji would like to say a word. Oh, oh it's okay. I have to clear myself. So I'm a nutritionist and I've worked with the Ghana Health Service. We've gone through rural areas and corners promoting exclusive breastfeeding. I would never on any forum such as big as this say exclusive breastfeeding is not beneficial. And I put it in context that in our society, due to what all the things that we have and the benefits we've seen of exclusive breastfeeding, it is very, very crucial. What I said was the dose response effects that the shorter durations, when you control for some covariates, they no longer seem to be effective. But we have to promote the six months exclusive breastfeeding. It's far, far better than feeding an infant. And even in our society where there is poverty, when the infant formula, you are supposed to mix one cup with half a cup, these rural folks would mix it thinly. So the, the nutrient content is no longer there. So Prof. Amuna, I know you are listening online. I thank you for the intervention. But on no occasion will I, as a nutritionist, say exclusive breastfeeding is not important, something that I promoted myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, time is far gone. And you will agree with me that uh, we've had a very exciting presentation. And everybody also has, has contributed to it. So on that note, I would like to uh, thank our presenter for doing a good job. It's been very beautiful. Thank you so much for coming. And then to the audience, we thank you all. You know, from the comments, from the questions, you know, your contribution, it indicates that you paid attention to what was going on. So we thank you so much for your involvement in these uh, presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. I wanted to special. I want us to special acknowledge the presence of the Vice Chancellor, Professor John Osu Japan, has joined us again. Shall we now invite Ms. Lily Eduabwaji to introduce to us the, the next, the, the person who will lead the next class. Thank you. Our professor who will lead the next session, that's the third session, is the director of the Center for Malaria Research, University of Health and Allied Sciences. Prior to that, she was deputy director responsible for research at the Research and Development Division of the Ghana Health Service. She is a public health physician and epidemiologist, a fellow of the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons and the Rockefeller Foundation, Bellagio. She currently serves on the World Health Organization's Malaria Policy Advisory Committee and Malaria Elimination Oversight Committee. She also serves on the Technical Evaluation Reference Group of the Global Fund to Fight HIV AIDS and Malaria and the Bellagio Academic Selection Panel of the Rockefeller Foundation. She contributes to the city building of the next generation of public health professionals 
as an adjunct lecturer at the college at the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons, the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, GIMPA, and the School of Public Health, University of Ghana. She has, over the, over the course of her career, supervised several PhD and master's students, both locally and internationally, and has several publications in peer-reviewed journals to her credit. Please, let's welcome Professor Evelyn Koko Ansa. Prof, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Lily. Thank you for the kind introductions. So this is the time when we will be given the awards for various categories. We will be giving awards for the best oral presentation, an award for the best poster that was exhibited, and then an award for the best ex exhibition. So I will just walk you through the process that the award team went through. So we set up two teams. One of the teams was mostly external. So we had mostly from a research and development division of the Ghana Health Service. And then one or two from um, other places in UHAS. The, then the other team was made up of representatives of the various schools, excluding IHR. The first team assessed both the oral presentations and the exhibitions. And every member, there were five in number, and every member did this independently and submitted their scores independently. The second team also went around the posters independently and assessed them using checklists that we had developed for all these three categories. And following their independent assessment, they submitted the scores to a team, the awards team, which missed out on quite a bit of the presentations because they were busy entering the scores as they came in. So the scores were all entered into a spreadsheet and the average score for each poster, each exhibition, each oral presentation was taken. So for the oral presentation, as you were presenting them, Assessors were sitting there scoring your presentation and how you answered questions as well. So the scores were then ranked to select who had the highest scores. Besides these 10 assessors, five in each of the two teams, there was a team of six awards committee members comprised of Dr. Alfred Manye, Dr. Mustafa Imurana, Dr. Fidelia Doga, Dr. Mr. Fidelis Anumu, and Mr. Chu Podolo, who is a national service person. Can you just rise so that we acknowledge you? You've done a lot of work. Just rise wherever you are. Thank you very much for all the hard work. Thank you. Thank you. And, and for the assessors also, we will be acknowledging these assessors in due course. But first of all, yes, before we, we, we look at who won what, I think we will acknowledge the assessors. And for the first team of assessors, who, yes, who looked at the oral and exhibition, we will want um, the university librarian to, to join me here for us to acknowledge them. Not this one. So 
Okay. So in no particular order, and we want to say a big thank you to you. The first person on our list is Dr. Dennis Edu Jesse from Kintampo Research Center. Please, can you come for your certificate? Is Dr. Edu Jesse here? He was just in the strong room with us. Okay. So, Dr. Solomon Nabana, are you around? Solo, thank you. So, please come for. Please give him a clap. They've done a lot of work in these few days from Dodoa Health Research Center. We, we are really grateful. So this is a certificate to express our appreciation to you for all the work you put in. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have Dr. Victor Aswala from Navrongo Health Research Center. Thank you very much. Shall we give them a clap? Thank you, thank you. This is one of the few entomologists who are still available. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then we have, um, we have Dr. George Wack, but he had to leave to go back to School of Public Health. But we have here Dr. Maxwell Dabala, who worked closely with him. Dr. Dabala. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dalaba, sorry, Dr. Dalaba. I've missed it up. Dr. Dalaba, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Shall we give him a clap? They've done a great work. I can't describe to you the amount of work they've had to do. It's a lot of work. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Theresa Edru. And then we will call now upon Professor Ernestina Donko to give the next set, which is going to the team that worked on the posters. I'm not sure if they are here. Now that team is from here, you has. We put them together from all the schools. Um, we have somebody from School of Public Health, somebody from School of Allied Health Sciences, School of Medicine, SBBS, and School of Pharmacy. I'm not sure if they are here, but I'll mention the names and those that are here will give it. So Dr. Hubert Amu, are you here? He's not here. The other Hubert, okay. Is Dr. Ni Kole Kote here? He has been around us all of the time. Okay. And what about Dr. Gifty Dufye Ampofu from School of Medicine? Are you here? Gifty is not here. I would have seen her. And then Dr. Ajua Buachi from SBBS. And then Dr. Benjamin Harley from School of Pharmacy. Are you here? So all of our people somehow are not here. So thank you very much. You can present them to me. <laughs> so I'll receive them on their behalf. Or are there people from the schools to come and pick them? It's okay. Okay. Dr. Harley is here. Where is he? Dr. Harley, come for your thing. <laughs> Okay, so we have Dr. Harley here. Let's give him a clap. They had to stand on their feet and read every single poster. Every one of them read every single poster and assessed every single poster. And there were 53 posters there and they had to read all of them. Thank you very much, Dr. Harley. Thank you. Thank you. 
you want to you want to take it on okay <laughs> so he also <laughs> but he's not here <laughs> okay so we thank you very much professor Ernestina Dongpo yes thank you so now we will be asking Dr. John Williams, director of the Dodowa Health Research Center to help us with the best presentation. Dr. Williams, if you... And we thank you, uh, colleagues from the research center for the great support for this dissemination. Thank you so much. So, with a mark of 65 out of 80 marks, I don't know if the presenter is here. If he's not here, I'll be very sad, or whoever it is. So, the title of the presentation was The Use of Herbal Medications in the treatment of COVID-19, future prospects. And the presenter was Richard Abiate. Congratulations, congratulations. Congratulations, Richard, congratulations. And this is a final year student from the School of Pharmacy. Congratulations. Then for the best poster presentation, we will be inviting the director of the Navrongo Health Research Center, Dr. Patrick Ansan. He, he bears my surname. But we don't have, there's no relationship. <laughs> so let's give him a clap. Again, thank you for bringing so many people in a bus to this dissemination and for staying through from beginning to the end. So for the best poster, we have the, the poster title is Phytogenicity and virulence profiles of exterior coli isolates in the whole teaching hospital of Ghana. And with a, a total mark of 38 out of 40, the first author was John Gameli Deku. Is he here? If he's not here, his team members, Kwamna Diodu. Silas, Kina, Nyoku, and Patrick Feglo. Is any of them here? Oh, so you didn't expect much. <laughs> so who, who will take this on their behalf? Somebody from... So this is the best poster. Congratulations. Somebody has taken his glory. <laughs> because he, he was a thank you. <laughs> Imagine that. So thank you, Dr. Patrick Ansa. Thank you so much. And now for the trophy. Hmm. This is for the exhibition. And for that, we will be inviting Professor Seth Oswege to help us with this trophy presentation. <laughs> mm. So, 
with a mark of 17 out of 20 marks. And you would admit, if I mention this particular um, school, that this is it. For the second time running, the School of Allied Health Sciences has taken this trophy. <laughs> so we invite the dean of the school and the heads of department here, please come. <laughs> come, the School of Allied Health Sciences. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, School of Allied Health Sciences, for putting up a great exhibition, for putting up such a brilliant exhibition. All the departments were represented fully. Congratulations. 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 <laughs> well done. Thank you very much, Professor Seth Ousredim. So my job is done. And I will invite Prof Professor Margaret Japon to come up. Or you. OK. I think we can give it up to Professor Ansa once again. If there is one man who smiled so brightly this morning, his face was beaming with smile, is the one who's that class of students are named after, the Japan babies. And of course, Professor Japan himself is here. And so we see your babies won the award. And needs to talk to us, and he will give us his remark as the chairman for this second you has research dissemination forum. Shall we welcome with a very big round of applause? Keep clapping until he climbs up here. So thank you all very much. And uh, I think it is good to say that we've really had a good time here and the time well spent. I have not been able to be around all the time, but the few times that I've been in here, I am very convinced that this is money well spent. Um, why do we do research dissemination? We do research dissemination to inform other people on the work that we're doing uh, so that we justify why we are being funded to do research. And also to let people know how our research is impacting society. So we don't do research in isolation, uh, but we try to impact society through the work that we do. But beyond that, we, as academics, so far, the only currency that is available for assessment of research performance and research output is scientific publications. So through these processes, we try to help uh, one another through peer review systems. So I make a presentation here, I get comments, I get feedback, I improve upon the work that I'm doing. And uh, by so doing, our work gets published 
And when our work gets published, we gain currency. You hear people say, oh, this person has over 100 publications. This person has over 200 publications. Some have 10, some have two, some have five. But uh, we all started from somewhere. I remember when my first paper got published in 1992. Those days, they used to send reprints. I don't know whether you know about reprints. Not the PDF one they send around these days. They will mail it to you in an envelope. From I received mine from London. And the, the photo of the queen stamp and everything was there. Stamped, mailed to me. And when I opened it, there were 50 copies of my publication, my scientific publication. I was so excited. And I decided uh, who I will give them to, who will receive the original publications, and who will receive the photocopy. You know, you have 50 reprints. You cannot give everybody. So you have to go and photocopy them. I, I still have some of the original reprints. They are different type of paper. And you keep it and you look at it. Is this me? You started one. That was one paper. But now when the papers even get published, I don't even notice. But we will all get there because we are all going to work hard. As a very young university with very young faculty, we think it is worth investing in research dissemination. So one of the avenues for disseminating our research findings is to come into a forum like this where we can, where, where we can present for other people to hear about our work. So it gives you experience. Um, before COVID, we all used to travel to either national or international conferences to go and make presentations. Uh, but with the advent of COVID, many of those have come down and uh, a lot of online dissemination conferences are being held. Uh, it's not the same. Being in a forum, sitting here with maybe now about 300 people here, uh, listening to you and seeing their faces, it's not like being online and talking, you know? So it gives you some experience of what it is like to do face-to-face -face presentations. And we learn from that. But one of the key things that has come up in this particular forum is the fact that we need to learn to work together. We need to learn to work together. And that, in my opinion was the theme of the conference where the keynote speaker from KNUSD devoted some time to inter, sorry, multidisciplinary research. It tells us that for our work to be impactful, it is better if we work across disciplines and even between disciplines in trying to address the same question. So somebody from SAS or from SBBS or from School of Medicine, we can address a particular issue more holistically. So let us try to work together. Let us try and collaborate because we get better mileage when we do that. You know, I keep saying many of us have been from the era where when you were in primary school and you were writing exams. I don't know whether you did that. Uh, you do this, you cover your, your work. You don't want anybody to see what you are writing. You don't want anybody to copy you. And so you do this and then you write. I, I, do you remember that? Okay. So... We are used to working 
alone in our solo tracks. But science has got into an era where now uh, if you submit any research work for publication, author, if you are the sole author, the assessors and the reviewers begin to ask questions. Did you do this the road? Was there nobody who worked with you who needs to be acknowledged? It basically tells you that we need to learn to work together. So let us bear that in mind that working together gives us better mileage. Of course, a few people have had their fingers bent. In science, like in every family, as they say, if you be a man's and woman, uh, uh, there are some unfaithful people in the area of science. So uh, you call Hawa and say, oh, Hawa, I have this idea. Uh, let's discuss and plan uh, how we can do A, B, C, D. Uh, before you are aware, in a month's time, Hawa has gone because she's sitting in the library. She has done a literature search and then gone ahead to publish it ahead of you. So because of that, some people don't want to share ideas and thoughts. I think we need to learn that we get better mileage when we work together and we are more credible when we work together. Yesterday, Professor Binka spent some time talking about grantsmanship. Research is done with money. And we need the big money. So we need to learn how to get the big money. It is a skill. Once you begin to get successful, you know, everybody wants to be associated with success. So once you are successful, uh, the funding agencies sometimes even contact you before they advertise their protocols. That, oh, we are thinking of, like Professor Binka said, uh, doing this project. Uh, we want to fund 10 study groups and we have $10 million for this work. So maybe approximately a million dollars for each project. If you have worked in the space before and the way they notice you is when you put out your work through scientific publications, they are likely to contact you. So let us not stop trying. Sometimes you try and you are not successful. Uh, the people in the field say that if your success rate in grantsmanship is 10%, you are doing very, very well. You know, many of us, you hear, oh, this person has won uh, $2 million. You don't know how many he didn't win. So we all have failures. Maybe we should share our failures from time to time so that you know that there are many, many, many failures along the way. So that you don't give up. But more importantly, you take the opportunity to learn how to attract the money, because without the money, we cannot do research. But having said that, I just want to assure you that it is possible. You can do it. And we can all do it if we work together and support one another. So whether you are in Yuhas or in Navrongo or Kintampo or Dodoa, or you are working in any of the uh, health service uh, directorates across the regions. We all need the money to do the research and we must learn to work together. I hope you have enjoyed this conference and I hope that you don't regret coming here and that your time has been well spent. So on behalf of the University of Health and Allied Sciences, I want to thank you for your participation. 
And uh, I pray that our third research dissemination forum would even be greater than this one. Um, please participate. Eh? Next time, participate. And don't just come and register to come and eat lunch. I know, I know, I, I see it. There are some people who come register and they, they vanish and around lunchtime, they appear. Don't sell your birthright for a morsel of bread. Eh? Food, what is food? Come and get knowledge. Come and be edified. Come and benefit from science. Then at the end of the day, you know that you have invested your time well. I thank you all for your attention. So it's almost lunch time. And uh, those who didn't participate who are inside, they are here. <laughs> Thank you, VC. When you ask what is food, my JHS one science lesson said matter. There was one thing that I forgot to comment on, I meant to comment on. This forum also generates controversy. If we are scientists, we may not agree on everything but we must discuss issues that come up dispassionately with the evidence. So I was excited when I realized that uh, Professor Amuna, who was online, was coming back and forth. And then the presenter also came back and told her point of, I mean, where, where, where she was standing. You know, this is science, eh? At the end of the day, the science should win. At the end of the day, the science must win. So let, let us not uh, be hesitant to get controversial at all when, when it gets to science. I've been to a few conferences where uh, very strong people who we respect have been at almost each other's throat because they disagree. But at the end of the day, uh, when the evidence is there, everybody sees it. So controversy uh, or scientific debate in a forum like this uh, is normal and healthy. I think we can give a round of applause. And so it's now time to take some uh, vote of thanks. And to do that, let's welcome Mr. Bafo Jamdakwa. Oh, a round of applause for him. Thank you, Molly. I think my job has even been done by Prof. Ansa, so I'll be very brief. We would like to first thank the Almighty God for giving us clear weather to host this conference, and also to the keynote speakers, namely Prof. Ellis Ousudabo, Pro VC of Kenya University, Prof. Fred Newton Benka, former Vice Chancellor of U.S., and Prof. Harry Tabo, Pro Vice Chancellor of U.S. And to all those who chaired the various sessions, Prof. Japong, Prof. Evelyn Ansa, and Dr. Teresa Edu, we say thank you. To our researchers from the research centers, Navrungo, Kintampo, and Navrungo, Navrungo, Kintampo, and Dodua, sorry, we say thank you. Ghana Health Directorate, the Regional Health Directorate, Ghana Health Services, all the administrators of UHAS, ICT, the faculty present, public affairs, staff, students, and I was asked to mention these names, Emily McJames of ICT, 
Emmanuel Benzel of ICT and Mr. Susu of the Works Department, we say a very big thank you. And to our committee members, the planning committee members, Prof. Japon, Prof. Evelyn Ansa, Prof. Margaret Japon, Prof. Evelyn Ansa, Prof. Seto Uswege, Professor Takan, Dr. Robert Alassa, Dr. Teresa Edu, Dr. David Lee, Dr. John Insa, Dr. Dominic J. Dankwa, Dr. Mengo, Dr. Kofi, Mr. Alfred Oforia Jemang, Ms. Evelyn Aqua, Mrs. Maria Algeria, Mr. Alexander, myself, Mr. Cedric Dokenu, Mr. Alfred Kuma, Mr. Ohinia J., Emily McJames, and Mr. Felis, Fel, Fidelis Anumu, we say a very big thank you. I would like to end here by saying the si boku, medase, and akwelo. Thank you. Well, uh, somebody said to me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what for? Um, if Mr. Haruna Ago is around, please see um, the gentleman just by the entrance here. Mr. Haruna Agongo, see Dr. Ivo Jani. He's waiting to see you immediately. Thank you. Just a quick one, uh, Professor Ansa, she forgot to mention. The, some of the schools, you'll notice that some of the schools removed their banners quickly. I think the first day or so, or the second day. The exhibition is supposed to last for the entire duration of the forum. So from the time we said opening prayer, to this moment when we are going to say closing prayer is when your posters are, are supposed to be there and your exhibitions are supposed to be there to be assessed. You may not know when the assessors go there. And so you may lose the marks. Results. So this is just for your information uh, for the next research dissemination forum. And so that you are aware that you must keep the uh, posters and your exhibition there throughout the period. Thank you. Um, for, we are going out for lunch after the closing prayer. Those who do not take the cheats, you know yourself, the Navrongo Research Center, Dodowa, um, we would lead you out to where you take your lunch. The rest of us who are at the back will ask you to come down and so that sharing becomes easier for, uh, for us. On that note, I will now invite before we take our closing prayer. This Sunday, the 31st day of July, marks the Thanksgiving service for the 10th anniversary celebrations of the university. It's coincides with the end of tenure of the vice chancellor and the registrar. And so it's a big day we're gonna have here in the city auditorium. The guest preacher will be Archbishop Charles Ajinasari of Perez Chapel. We're having a lot of other side attractions you need to be here. And so we are inviting all of you to be part of the 10th anniversary Thanksgiving service right here at the city auditorium this Sunday, 8 a.m. Thank you. On that note, we'll now invite Dr. Hajia Hawa Osman to give us the closing prayer. Oh, let's give her a round of applause as she comes to do that. Thank you, Maori. Uh, please let's bow down our heads for prayers. Bismillah uh, rahman rahim Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin rahman rahim maliki yawmidin. 
Iyaka na abudu wa iyaka na staim. Idina sirata al-mustakim. Sirata al-lazina na amta alayhim. Geru magdubi alayhim wala doli. Amen. God Almighty, we thank you very much for being with us from the start of this conference to the end. We call upon you when we started and then we are happy that you've answered our prayers. Many are our thoughts, many are our thinkings, many are our wishes that we would have want to express, but some of them we've not been able, others we were able. For this, we thank you so much for giving us the strength, for giving the presenters the strength to present, for giving us the heart, the strength to also sit through, to listen. We thank you very much. As we are departing from here, we are not departing from your presence. Please be with us. Take us to our various destination, to those who are going as far as to Kintampo and beyond. We pray for Jenny Messies. We also pray that as we are going to take our meals, you sanctify the meals and make it uh, something that to sustain us. We thank you very much for being with us and making this meeting a success. Amen. Thank you. We will take a group photo. And so we would have... BC and the team in front here, all of us will come close. Those of you at the back here, you come behind. Those of you at this end will also come. Uh, Director Dodua Research Center, please come forward and join um, the team in front. Director Kintampo, uh, uh, what's the name? Navrongo as well. Let's do that quickly, please. Those of you behind, please just come down. We'll maintain the roads and come down. Regional Director, OT Region, Ghana Health Service. Please, well, deans and directors, join in quickly. We would like to acknowledge our sponsors to Ghana Medical Journal, KCS, and Fred's Kitchen. Thank you for sponsoring the program. Thank you, but, for, but you didn't thank the MC. I thank myself. And those of you online, we thank you very much. We will take a photo with you, so we'll be there. And when we are ready, we will let you put your videos on, so we'll take another shot with you. Please come in, feel in here. Those of you descending, feel in. This way, they are coming. Some people can come down this way. So we, we are ready to take it. You can feel in the back, we'll get you. Everybody will show. That way. Okay, we'll take as many as can show in the camera. Thank you. I think I deserve to be in. Thank you. Let's have uh, the front row here. No, only the front row, please. Uh, please come. These are directors. We will take, put your videos on now. I see Professor Amuna. I see Joyce. I see Emmy. Bridie Alpen. Uh -huh. Let's see the rest of you. Put on your videos. We're taking a good photo with you. 
technology is good. Uh huh. Joyce, uh -huh. readjust yourself. We can see you. <laughs> Dr. Anthony Da, you are acknowledged. We have seen you. Ready? You have? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Akpakakaka. Oh, we say let us be seated. When will we do this thing, right? Let's remain seated. They will bring us a lunch pack row by row. Yes. Let's speak it for you. Let's remain seated. They will bring us a Lunch row by row. This row. 